Attention Talking Simpsons listeners, we have a special mini-series just for you. We're going through the entire first season of King of the Hill, and you can only hear it if you're a $5 and up patron at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. We're giving the Talking Simpsons treatment to all 13 episodes of King of the Hill's first season, and if you want a free sample, you'll find the first episode available for free in the Talking Simpsons feed. Patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. It's the only place you'll find the first season of Talk King of the Hill. Man, you go click, 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 click. It's real easy, man. Cartoons from present in the past. Every week will be an animated bash. Woo! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Maybe a short but mostly shows. We'll talk, we'll analyze, exploring as we go. What a cartoon! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Hello, everybody, and welcome to What a Cartoon, where we're trained to meet the unusual before it happens. I'm your host, the non-filmation version of Bob Mackey, and this is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever who is here with me today. Henry Gilbert in an invisible man was sleeping in my bed. Mm -hmm. And today's episode is the real Ghostbusters episode, Ragnarok and Roll. We're the Ghostbusters. We're trained to meet the unusual before it happens. And we have a real theme uh, this month, don't we, Henry? Oh, yes. Yeah. Surprisingly good toy <laughs> uh, commercial cartoons. I didn't expect it to be all this toy stuff. But yeah, you know, this is a favorite of mine. I just love all the heroes from Ghost Command, Kong, Spencer, and Tracy, while they battle ghouls in their ghost buggy and uh, talk on the bone phone. And, and there's uh, some lots of Larry Storch action yeah, involved. Yeah, like, oh, wait, I'm getting something in my <laughs> earpiece here. Oh, wait, we're doing the other Ghostbusters. Oh, the real, at real Ghostbusters? Yeah. On Twitter, I d- I am grossly unprepared for this podcast. Oh now. I, no, I'm kidding. Seriously, folks, I've never even seen that awful filmation. I definitely watched it. It had a good opening. That tra- filmation stepped it up for the opening. It actually is a well animated one. But I mean, filmation is cheaper. It, 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 somehow, Deke was way higher budget than uh, than filmation was. Even though Deke seems cheap in the same kind of ways. But yes, this is the real Ghostbusters, which. T- for a certain generation of fans, this is our Ghostbusters, not the first movie. Yeah, because we were too young for the first movie. I was three when the first movie came out. Like, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't see it in theaters. I couldn't appreciate a ghost blowjob gag the <laughs> way I would as an adult. Now it's the funniest thing ever. But yeah, because of uh, when we were born, this and Ghostbusters 2 were our Ghostbusters. Mm. And this still holds up. Yes, yeah. The, Ghostbusters uh, 2 was a lot of fun, but it's also uh, just a bad movie. Uh, I was so into the show as was my little brother we uh as i've told before on these podcasts i was a spoiled little boy Mm -hmm. who was given all the toys he wanted (laughs) uh but i did have a ton of toys for this i watched a video of ghostbusters toys and i felt like a third of them i was like i had that one i had that one i had the my favorites were the they weren't exactly transformers but they were regular looking things that then turned into a scary monster like the uh giant football player who actually his back opened up and had scary monster teeth I live vicariously through other toy boys, so a lot of my (laughs) friends had these toys. I never really was into toys. I liked video games a lot more, Mm -hmm. so I only had video games for the most part. But I actually did get one of the uh, Proton Pack thingies. Oh, man, the big blue plastic Proton Pack. Yeah, I had that too, yeah. But it was one of the ones that was a special one that was designed. It was basically like a slide projector. Oh, yeah. And that used it in the dark, and when you hit a button, it would make spooky noises, and you would hit another button on it, and it would move the slide around, so like different things would happen on the slide. But it was actually like too scary scary for me to use at first. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. wow. I had the, I must, I had the one before that. I remember the commercials for that. It's like, Slimer's on the wall. Yeah. But, yeah. But you had the one with the big piece of foam you stuck to the end. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That foam was destroyed pretty quickly oh, yeah. by my childish hands. Uh, and, and I had the EPK meter and the trap as well. I had that. Mm. And uh, I had a Venkman toy. I didn't have a toy of all of them, but I did have a Venkman toy, which was my favorite. And then I, I did have for all of them the toys that had the scary reactions where their faces explode. Those suck because you couldn't play with them as 
as well because you had to like move around their dumb reaction face. And they had like tiny breakable parts on them. Yeah. But uh, the cartoon though, so around the time that this cartoon started, uh, DuckTales was starting and I was becoming a more sophisticated five-year-old <laughs> TV viewer. And uh, before that, I would watch anything animated on TV and just absorb it, uh, just staring vacantly at the TV. <laughs> but around this time, like I started remarking to myself like, oh yeah, these are my favorite shows. I love DuckTales and I love the real Ghostbusters mm-hmm. for the same reasons, uh, especially I can recognize that as an adult. It's like, oh, these are still for kids and, uh, you know, cartoons for kids are obviously much better now in terms of their writing uh, and maybe animation. But uh, even now I could tell like, oh, this is so much smarter than like the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo or whatever else was <laughs> happening in the world this time. He-Man, yeah. all those things. Yeah, I know. Ghostbusters was the first run of Ghostbusters was so much smarter than it had any reason to be. Same with like, we said this about the select episodes of G.I. Joe that we experienced for the G.I. Joe one. Like, these were toy commercials. No one wanted, nobody in charge was getting paid more to make it a good written script or have interesting acting in it or good animation. Like, it was, again, a toy commercial, but there were people involved in it who actually cared and wanted to make those things better. And I was such a big fan of it. I at least one year went as a Ghostbuster. Like, and my. Oh, I'm sure I did too. My poor, poor mom sewing that Ghostbuster logo onto a kid-sized jumpsuit that she purchased for me and my brother so we could both be Ghostbusters. Did you uh, buy it at the tiny mechanic store? <laughs> <laughs> they mu- I mean, I think they must. Uh, there must have been a run on making those kid-sized yeah. jumpsuits, for, uh, which did not transfer over into the Mystery Science Theater years. It's, it's funny how non-toyetic the movie is. And man, the, this show is built for toys. What I love especially about this show is that they all wear different color jumpsuits. When I went back to watch the movie for the first time as a kid, I'm like, they're all dressed in brown. This is boring. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's more of a uniform instead of a distinct look to them. I, I totally get why they changed those costumes. Uh, and yes, and my, my love of the show, though, changed about when I was nine, partially because I think I didn't know I didn't like it, but the changes in voice acting. I think did turn me off, but also hurt it was knowing that my baby six-year-old brother liked Slimer that a lot. That scoundrel. <laughs> he liked all the kid stuff because he was six. Of course he liked the kid stuff, but yeah. then that turned me off to it because I'm like, I'm a big boy. I'm a big nine-year-old. I don't like this anymore. I need dark stories about hell mm-hmm. and death. I mean, Batman was coming in a couple years, so I'd finally, I'd get the grown-up things for a big boy like me that I deserve. But I love this cartoon so much uh, that I thought that the first Ghostbusters movie was the boring movie (laughs) and two was the better movie because two was just like it wasn't the cartoon but it was like it was wackier Mm -hmm. it involved lots of slime they knew the cartoon was popular the cartoon willed that movie into existence no one wanted to do it and it's clear on the screen (laughs) and I felt the same way about Back to the Future I was like oh Back to the Future 1's the boring one two is where it's at (laughs) when two is not as bad as Ghostbusters 2 in fact it's it's a fine movie but Back to the Future 1 is like a perfect script Mm -hmm. yeah I think I think Ghostbusters 2 Aykroyd and Ramis especially were two influenced by the cartoon maybe in there the the film starts with the ghostbusters dancing for children like that's that's how much they knew kids were into it and the kids were mad it wasn't he-man yes one famous little boy (laughs) though by 89 they were more they were bigger than he-man he-man was on the outs buddy that's true yes why don't we go into that history of the real ghostbusters which is really two series and i think we're only going to focus on the first half of what is the series the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, a surprising amount of content. Look at it, I was like, this is so many more episodes I showed. This shows you it was the biggest show of the 80s, like consistently the biggest for how much they produced compared to even so many of its its popular contemporaries. Uh, so the short version of the <laughs> pre-show history is that a couple of unrelated things called Ghostbusters in the years before 1984 toyed around with the idea of a comedic bunch of goofs that were basically rat catchers for the paranormal. Like, there's a Mickey Mouse cartoon that's pretty much the Ghostbusters. There's a Bob Hope movie called called Ghostbusters. There was even a mid-70s filmation live action show starring Larry Storch that was about Ghostbusters who chased down ghosts. Like, it was not a particularly original idea, though when you're the biggest star in comedy at the time, off of the hottest comedy show of the 70s, you're just coming up with your own goofy ideas because you're a weirdo like Dan (laughs) Aykroyd is. Yes, and his original script was way weirder than what was on the screen yeah it's in the future (laughs) there's a ghostbuster corporation i mean 
In uh, in a couple oral histories I read of Ghostbusters, the film, Dan Aykroyd, they talk about how like he is a great idea man, but he just has these very loose collection of yeah. ideas that you have to then hammer into place, which is what all the other writers on Ghostbusters did. If you want to see unfiltered Dan Aykroyd, go watch Nothing But Trouble, the horror comedy. Ooh, it's a ooh. fascinatingly terrible movie that's still very compelling to watch. I, I haven't watched that. It's, uh, it's probably since I was a child. It was like on HBO or something. My yeah. mom loves that movie, and she references <laughs> it constantly still to this day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Aykroyd pitched the idea of it originally with the idea that he would co-star with his friend John Belushi who would die the same mm. year as he was writing it, uh, who would then become the spirit of a uh, green monster called Onion Head in the, uh, the original film. The script was reworked by future co-stars Bill Murray and Harold Ramis alongside the future director of the film, Ivan Reitman, and they eventually sell to Columbia the idea of a very big budget action comedy which really didn't exist at the time, like not on that scale in the 80s. Ghostbusters was a type of film that hadn't been done before, and they had less than a year to finish writing the script, shoot it, and edit it with all of the effect shot. 200 effect shots. Like, it sounds like an incredibly chaotic filmmaking experience for that movie. Part of it, too, is they had to license the name from Filmation, which uh, had the rights to the name Ghostbusters. And so they did, and I'll get to more of that in a little bit, but it was released in 1984, a huge box office smash with a Ray Parker Jr. theme song that controlled radio for most of the 80s. I think you mean it's a Huey Lewis theme song. Uh, That's what the courts did decide. Yes, yeah. (laughs) I want a new drug. Ghostbusters! Busters. Yeah. I don't hear the words Ghostbusters at the end of I Want a New Drug. They're Case distinct. Closed. Dis- legally distinct. <laughs> but no, it was, yeah, the song was so big, it got sued by Huey Lewis. I mean, yeah, but that's that's a story for another day. But that song, the Ray Parker Jr. song, is very important to this animated series. Oh, yeah. Well. You never stop hearing it. So it was a huge hit in 1984, and that was an interesting new era in TV animation in America as well, because while Saturday morning cartoons were still tops, more and more shows were doing first run syndication as we were entering the mid 80s in 1984 there were hits like he-man inspector gadget and heathcliff all of which launched with massive production achievement of releasing 65 original episodes at once because that's the number you have to hit to be purchased as a syndicatable weekday animated series. And we are still in the era where cable is just catching on. It's not Mm -hmm. a mainstream thing, so it's important to be on one of the three to four channels someone has in their home. It wouldn't be until 86 that Nickelodeon would license their first animated series, Mm. like as in a full animated series, not clips on pinwheel, that they were able to get from like educational Canadian material. (laughs) The last two of those, Inspector Gadget and Heathcliff, were huge early hits for Deke a uh, pronounced Deke like I can't believe yeah. they, they went with that name those saucy <laughs> Frenchmen I was surprised to hear they actually originated out of Luxembourg before going to oh, France weird. Uh, but yes it uh, Deke stands for a diffusion information at communication mm. And uh, the company was a dual French and American animation production company, mainly working on French shows in the 70s. And in the 80s, they did their first American-French co-production called Inspector Gadget, which was a total Inspector Clouseau ripoff starring uh, the Get Smart agent. So much that they had to change his appearance. From the pilot. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But it was a huge hit in America. That was when uh, American businessman Andy Hayward, who had worked at Hanna-Barbera took over the company and pulled it more and more towards Uh, America until eventually he just bought out the French at the end of the 80s. Andy Hayward, he was so prolific and also not very good at his job of writing cartoons because uh, for Retronauts and for this and for other things that we've done podcast wise we've talked about a lot of the Deke video game cartoons and you were like, oh, who wrote this Captain N episode? Andy Hayward. He also wrote all of them. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, look, the point is you gotta hammer out words and it eventually is an episode. So that's that's all you got to do. Yeah, the Deke uh, would only get bigger and bigger and bigger. They their big thing was licensed properties. Heathcliff after Heathcliff, Inspector Gadget was an original for original for them. Uh, but Heathcliff was their first licensed show, and they'd only go on to do more and more of that. Another fact I only found out in this research on Deke was from a 1987 New York Times article about the company going public, which was when it was going to make a ton of money, and it was marked as the only non-union anime 
Animation Studio in the U.S. Oh, wow. It actually fought off an attempt to unionize in 1984. So, uh, boo, yeah. Deke. Things like, are very different now. Yeah. <laughs> off the success of Gadget and Heathcliff, they grew and grew with more and more shows that were based on existing properties and had toy tie-ins. Plus, they were at the forefront of using Japanese anime studios to produce their shows. Deke got Inspector Gadget and Heathcliff to be animated by the same people who were doing Lupin cartoons at the same time in Japan. It's crazy to think about. They were one of the first to do it. Like DuckTales hired TMS because TMS worked on Deke shows first. They, mm, they knew them right. as the people to do it. Yeah, in the mid-90s when I was getting into anime and I hadn't seen real Ghostbusters in like five or six years, I started hearing and seeing things that reminded me of real Ghostbusters, like sound effects. Like the sound effects mm. of their blasters you can hear in so many 90s <laughs> and 80s anime. You're right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And their explosions too. Like there's, there's wild takes in the show that are so anime as well like just posing and movements i we picked this episode ragnarok and roll because it's the most anime of them yeah too. and in fact uh, if you look at the creative side of things uh who's credited in the credits it's all japanese production from mm-hmm. storyboards on like the script is translated for them and then they create the entire episode. No one is shipping yeah. storyboards to Korea or Japan or anything like that. Um, some episodes had American storyboarders. There's one American credit with storyboard on this. The rest are Japanese names. Mm, I wonder if they just kind of oversaw things then. I, I don't want to steal uh, credit from anyone, but <laughs> there were so many Japanese people credited to this. I just have to wonder how much production mm-hmm. was on the American side. I think character designs were on the American side. Be- Deke needed Japan so much that they actually opened up their own sub studio wow. in Japan called KK Deke that was used to get around the expensive the most expensive part of it which was the subcontractors who negotiate with the Japanese studio. And even even worse name than yeah. Deke. KK Deke yeah it's uh they were also working closely with ABC which aired some of their shows and and eventually Deke would actually be sold to ABC so they had a very close relationship with them and in 1986 they had four big new properties three of which were based on giant popular well popular things Dennis the Menace oh yeah watched it Teddy Ruxpin uh didn't didn't watch it I watched a couple episodes of it Popples yeah uh, I had a Popple. Didn't watch many. Is episodes. that the Disney one? Uh, the you, first, like, you're thinking of the Wuzzle. Wuzzles. God or, damn it. Yeah, the, the Popples were the ones that you closed into a ball and they became, and then you popped them out of their ball. What form. did Wuzzles do? Uh, I think the Wuzzles were the ones that were like a mix of animals. It's like it's uh, a beef, a bear. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, an adaptation of Ghostbusters. Mm. Now, Filmation, they are also an animation production company, and they thought they'd get to do the Ghostbusters cartoon tune because Columbia paid them $500,000 for the use of the name Ghostbusters. Nice. But they were also promised 1% of the profits of Ghostbusters, which ended up being zero because Ghostbusters officially is an unprofitable film. Ooh, I like it. That's uh, This is a trick in Hollywood, listeners, if you don't know, where they can somehow say that all the costs of every film went into this film, or they just put costs and costs and costs on top of the film to then say it was unprofitable, to then not have to pay people money, so... Even though Ghostbusters was the biggest film of 1984, it somehow was not a profitable Hmm. film. Filmation, though, thought they'd still get some extra money by selling an adaptation to Columbia, which they pitched. They made a whole pitch thing for it. And Columbia was like, we're going to go with Deke instead. And Filmation was just screwed. The uh, the One of the presidents of Filmation even said, like, we should have made the deal. Instead of for 1% of the profits, we should have made the deal to animate the show. Like, that should have been the deal. Yeah, I mean, how could you look at Filmation's work and then see the pilot that Deke made? And yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the pilot is, uh, I think some of the footage from the pilot is the intro, right? Sorry to... If I'm stealing yeah, fire Yeah, no, they here. reuse a little yeah. of that. Yeah, Deke gets to do the show, and yeah, they they order, animated, I'm sure, by TMS. There's some very TMS oh, God, footage in yeah. there. That, uh, the, yeah, it's hella anime. Filmation would never have spent the money or had the connections with yeah. the good uh, anime companies to make that show real, for sure. Yeah, so I'm glad Filmation didn't do it. Like, they, but they got quick into making their own Ghostbusters and they show you (laughs) and they got to call it Ghostbusters and over a year out from debut Deke knew that they were going to have 
competition, so they may- knew they had to name their show The Real Ghostbusters, which is even the name in that pilot footage that's out there. Like, they knew that <laughs> early they had to call it The Real Ghostbusters. It's, it's so great that a subtweet about another show is baked into the title, yeah. <laughs> and it always seemed so awkward until uh, I mentioned Twitter earlier. That's just how you verify yourself on Twitter. Oh, like, yeah. I'm Real Bob Servo on Instagram <laughs> now, and our president uh. is Real Donald Trump. Yep, Unlike he, Filmation's he really Donald Trump. He really was. He, yeah. I'm shocked he's not in the Ghostbusters movie, you know, when I think back. Yeah. On it. uh, it's such a New York thing. But yeah, they had to call it real Ghostbusters. And that, that branding worked on us as kids, too. I If Ghostbusters played, I'd watch it a little bit just because it was a cartoon on TV. But I knew it wasn't the real Ghostbusters. There was zero fake Ghostbusters penetration in my childhood. <laughs> Only later in life did I find out there was another Ghostbusters. And that's why it was the real Ghostbusters. Uh, Okay. So I I was lucky. (laughs) Man, everybody, look out the production reel for it. You know, this amazing, this amazing Ghostbusters nerd found the actual, like, reel, like the real reel that they made and 4K'd it as best as possible. So there's an amazing one out there. Was this a fairly recent uh, discovery? It was put on the Blu ray. Yeah. Well, so the. The pitch reel was always in the hands of Deke and then the people who bought Ghostbusters after that, but they didn't know if they could even legally release it or if they wanted to. But then when they made the big Ghostbusters DVD package at the end of the 2000s, they decided it was time to finally release it. So it was officially released then. I bet you could still find it before then, though I didn't know about it before then. I don't think I did either. And I believe, uh, I wish I would have watched that before this podcast, but I believe the characters look a little more closer to their movie star. So, yeah, that you can see they're figuring out what they're going to do now. They did have all beige jumpsuits in the... uh, Yeah. Winston and... And Egon do look like their cartoon selves, as does Ray. But uh, Venkman looks more like Bill Murray. He even has like kind of the cheek lines uh, that uh, that look like Bill Murray's, and a lighter head of hair as well. I gotta say, some of the characters in their current forms look close enough to their counterparts, so you know who they're supposed to be. But Venkman is like the most flattering version of Bill Murray <laughs> ever. He's got like this perfect chin and this great head of hair. He's like a very handsome man. Yeah, yeah. I get that's why. It was my favorite. I love Peter Venkman. He's uh, the p- pilot reel is just a music video set to the full Ghostbuster song. It plays as long as the song. And there's some other key differences too. Is that Slimer or Onion Head is in it, as is Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. But Onion Head is a villain in it. He's he is trapped at the end of it. Now he's front and center because they did know they were going to make him part of the show. But he's treated as an evil ghost like the others. He's not the the friendly comic relief pal that he will be in the show slimer (laughs) slimer you gooey monster you uh and after that pitch reel the production on the show began uh one of the lead producers on it was joe medjuk who was a producer on the film and worked a ton with ramus and uh Aykroyd and all those other guys on their films also that guy would go on to be a founder or co-founder of criterion collection interesting uh, i did not expect to see that nice work (laughs) but he was in charge of the transition of it from a film for adults to a children's cartoon show that could sell toys. And uh, the cast would mostly be the film cast. You'd have Venkman, Ray, Egon, Winston, and Janine, but you would lose Dana and Sully. Sully would return in like season six. Mostly those two were cut out because they were, they were, I think they were seen as like, if this was an episodic show, these were the people they helped this week and they'll help different people next week. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they did not treat Sigourney Weaver's character as uh, as integral to the show, which is what they did do in Ghostbusters 2, and I think that is better. Like is they, uh, is Lewis in their uh, Rick Moranis character in he, the in the episodes? After Ghostbusters 2, they add him to the show. I thought so, yeah. yeah. The, the, they still never added Dana to the show, but they also decided that the breakout star of the movie, Onion Head, would be their cute and gross comic relief, and he would be renamed as Slimer, the, the obvious name to give him. I mean, it's Snarf. He's Snarf. It's yeah. It's just... Except he's more, even more unintelligible. Venkman would be played by Garfield's own Lorenzo oh. Music, doing basically the same voice. I love every it's, second I hear of him. Oh, his voice is magical. I got to say, like they were ble- like anything you make him say, <laughs> it just sounds beautiful. Yep, it's, it's all so perfect. Funny. Yeah, it's 
all the and the writing isn't bad either but he makes it all work amazingly and ray and slimer are voiced by a veteran of the of the field of frank welker and he's kind of doing a midwestern thing with ray that does mm-hmm. remind me of dan Aykroyd, chicago <laughs> chicago. chicago yeah it uh, he fits it a little bit i uh, there's a funny from 1990 behind the scenes of the real ghostbusters that is mainly interviews with Aykroyd and ramus who had nothing to do with <laughs> the show uh though Aykroyd has the funny line of like ramus says i was shocked to see what my ca- that i'm a blonde guy with a pompadour now and then Aykroyd says my character's definitely the fat one yeah <laughs> like uh which explains why ray got slimmed down in the uh change up oh, seasons man. i think uh and then you've got relative newcomer in 1985 maurice lamarche doing the voice of egon he is really doing the harold ramus impression yeah he's he joked in interviews of saying I was told not to do an impression, and then I did it and got the job. <laughs> so, so jokes on them. But also, in the cases of Welker and M- Lamarche, they got guys who could play five other voices every episode, yeah. as they do in this episode. Uh, and then there was pre-talk show host at Arsenio Hall as Winston Zedmore. I can't believe that. In a sad story that Ernie Hudson himself told, he tried out for the role and did not get it. The history of the Ghostbusters is about Winston Erasure, I think. Yes, just treating Ernie, like, Ernie Hudson especially like shit. Like, yeah. And uh, I believe uh, recent as of like, I don't know, five years ago interview, he was talking about how his role was much bigger mm-hmm. when it was intended for Eddie Murphy to play. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 And then he said he then got a second draft of the script that he doesn't enter until page 40. And he's like, what What the hell happened, guys? Uh, and that's what happened. You're you are not equal. You're not on the posters. You're not on anything. You're you're the black guy from Ghostbusters. That's all you are. And also Janine was on the show, too. Uh, and also uh, a fun fact fact about it was that the primary cast would record together often in los angeles like they, which was not the case usually oh wow but uh, but the producers liked the kind of feel you got of them playing off each other like i think the creators on the show knew the chemistry between the ghostbusters on screen was key to making the comedy work on this show too and uh, the characters were redesigned a bit by uh, character designer jim mcdermott who's mm. a, a very nice artist uh it was to get around likeness rights uh and a potential lawsuit is i would specifically think from bill murray because he's the most cantankerous of the group who oh, hates yeah. ghostbusters the most i really wonder how that genesis game got away with those uh hideous caricatures of all those people i think uh, i think they weren't looking as closely yeah again. they were all made distinct but also distinct so you can sell toys no kid wants to buy toys of four three white brown, guys all in yeah. a brown suit they need to look different oh god i love the designs on this show so much <laughs> yeah. i love egon's little red like glasses too they're so great yeah yeah when i I saw Ghostbusters after watching real Ghostbusters. I was shocked that uh, Egon wasn't blonde. I was like, what's going on here? You're you're a blonde guy. They made a mistake. <laughs> the first three seasons, the most prolific writer and story editor is in the guy. I You'd call him head writer in those times. The, the title was story editor. That was J. Michael Straczynski, who was fresh off of He-Man. He was a cartoon vet. He would go on to be the creator of Babylon 5 and write a ton of popular comic books oh he's he's a very big genre writer must have been so happy to be free of he-man <laughs> this ghostbusters probably felt like a dream after he-man like he what i love about straczynski when he does extras for like the he-man dvds or the dvds for ghostbusters he has the fuck you money to be like i don't have to be nice about how this show was run fuck yeah. you guys i'll say what i liked and i'll say what i didn't like so there's some real honest things about ghostbusters we know thanks to, to, to straczynski and uh, he let a writer's room that was very focused on digging up old myth and legends that the ghostbusters could face yeah again we did uh, mighty max a few weeks ago and that really reminds me of mighty max where just like let's explore mythology and the world and mm-hmm. history through this framing device because in the film, they fight Gozer. They fight yeah, things that, like... Sumerian gods and stuff like that. Yeah, part of Ghostbusters is finding an old book that then tells them who they're facing, and then they find out a sciencey way to fight fight this old god. Like, this was definitely... I didn't retain it, but this is when I was introduced to the idea of Banshees, though in the Ghostbusters, the Banshee had become a cool 80s pop star. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, the Babylonian god Marduk, who is uh, an important plot point in Neon Genesis Evangelion, and Cthulhu. Yeah, that's right. Cthulhu. 
Cthulhu. The episode's like the collect call of Cthulhu. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the series, I was just thinking while watching this this morning that uh, we were in the uh, satanic panic of the 80s where mm-hmm. everything was uh, having, well, according to certain groups, everything has satanic messages in it. Entertainment is made by Satan. And watching this episode where this guy like chants uh, some language and an evil face appears in the sky. I wonder <laughs> how many times this uh, show appeared in those crazy newsletters by right? conservative Christians. Yeah, it uh, it kind of breaks all those rules of, uh, I well, they got away with it in first run syndication in a way that even first run syndication wouldn't get away with like two years oh, later. Yeah. yeah. And uh, as was the style at the time, Time, writing, recording, some backgrounds and storyboards, and a lot of character designs. They were handled stateside, mostly out of Burbank. But then they would get sent over to KK Deek, who would either have freelancers they would hire to just stitch it all together or they would go directly to studios to do the work for them too and that's how they came together now on the u.s side of things there were a bunch of future luminaries of animation who worked under art director merrick buckwald and that includes future batman superstars bruce tim ken altieri and dan reba altieri himself like he is the one american name i saw associated with the animation on the pilot as well Mm. and also as you mentioned bob camp was one of the character designers as was everett peck and eddie wow. fitzgerald yeah and whenever we do uh, talking simpsons and there's a new director that we talk about their history i see the real ghostbusters so many times well it was such a prolific show if you were if you were in the machine in the 80s there's a chance you touched it just because they probably wanted to work on it and draw <laughs> cool monsters yeah yeah that's you look at the first spate of ghostbusters and even some of the later ones with the crazy monster designs like these are people like ever Peck or the or the fucked up shit that Bob Camp is so great at drawing like that's all there on screen perfect job for them yeah yeah and uh, meanwhile real Ghostbusters had amazing overseas studios working with them under producer Tetsuo Katamiyama he was uh, their go to he was like the middleman in between he was the head of KK Deke a lot of A-list workers from TMS and Toei my belief is that Toei handled the production mainly on this episode based on a couple of credits mm. and all also, it just has a real Toei feel mm, and okay. look to it. But later seasons, as they would get a little cheaper, would go to Dong Yang, Seiram, uh, and Studio Kurumi, like sm- smaller uh, Korean studios and or Japanese studios. When the show looks its best, it's very anime. My notes, every time I'm like, that is such an anime shot. That is yeah. such an anime shot. We are still in the era where you can just send everything to Japan. Mm. And then as time would go on, we get into the early 90s. It's like, we can send uh, eight out of 65 episodes to japan maybe <laughs> yeah uh, japan kept upping and upping their prices as they should because they were yeah. worth it but you can see like from 83 to 86 deke could afford tms in 87 only disney could afford tms by 93 only steven spielberg could yeah. justify the payment for tms and then yeah. only for a portion yeah only for a portion or for a direct to video thing. Yeah, yeah yeah like batman couldn't get tms unless they're like oh we've got the budget for a direct-to-video movie can you do can you do return of the joker can you do wacko's wish uh some of the names i found associated with it that worked on stuff we've heard of is masayuki uh aeki who worked on uh, who directed many episodes of harlock and devil man in the 70s Ooh. and 80s you've got moriyasu tanaguchi who worked on idion and escaflone and keiko uchida who worked on urusei atsura there's so and there's tons and tons more there but also people People who, at least on IMDb, their only credit are American productions like Real Ghostbusters and other Deke shows, which makes me think they just weren't properly credited on the Japanese shows they worked Could be. on. So the show debuted in 1986 with a first season of 13 episodes that debuted on Saturday mornings on ABC in the fall. But what was going on behind the scenes was they were being produced concurrently with a 65 syndication order. Those 13 episodes were done first to air then while they sat on the rest of them until the 65 were done for a November 1987 debut of all 65 episodes just dumped 
watched it once, played in a row. Those are the ones that hit me. I don't know if I was yes. around for the first first ABC season, but uh, this was just uh, constant after school watching. Like I remember just the taste of fish sticks in my mouth when I'm watching these episodes. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or an after school hot dog. I had some bunless hot dogs. That was one of my after school meals as well. Or macaroni and cheese. Mm. All the uh, the things your mom makes you after a long day at work that she gives you. Yeah. Uh, and I and I love you, mom. The, now it's just a mom thing. Uh, the show was a huge hit right out the gate on ABC. Highest rated show they had. The highest rated Saturday morning show of 1986-87 season. And also the music was a big part of the hit. It was bathed in the Ray Parker Jr. song. Oh, opened yeah. and ended with it and played during the episode two. This uh, series hit me when my brain was at its most uh, plastic or elastic or however you say that. And uh, just the incidental music is all in my head. Like <laughs> yeah. all, all eight. So there's not even a lot of the music mm-hmm. in this in series, but it's all in my head. Like, well, here's the wacky song. Here's the spooky song. Here's the wrapping things up song. And uh, that music was mainly written by Chaim Saban and Shuki Levy yeah. before they started Saban Industries. They should have stayed musicians. Yeah. Go the fuck. Uh, these are bad people. <laughs> <laughs> well, even Shuki. Well, who, not I Shuki. <laughs> Uh, so uh, as those aired, Deke finished this 80, 65 episodes that they debuted in fall 87, which is though at the same time, ABC commissioned a second season of the show to air two that would air 13 episodes. But ABC had some demands, which uh, are perfectly summed up by J. Michael Straczynski in this clip. Toward the end of the first season, the first network season, we had the number one show in Saturday morning. We were getting killer ratings, killer reviews. Everyone loved us. So having the most successful show on the air, it therefore behooves the network to try and fix it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's just how it goes with executives. I, I could go on a whole rant about this, but once a thing is successful that executives weren't involved in, they then feel they have to make it more successful by turning it into a completely different Yeah, thing. they need to justify their pointless jobs. Exactly, exactly. And so when those 65 episodes were airing, at the exact same time, ABC was fucking with the next 13 episodes mm. they got from Deke to make it more of what they thought kids wanted when kids clearly wanted the show that was the top-rated show on Saturday mornings. Uh, but in ABC's opinion and in the network's opinion, that's also the syndicated episodes got to get away with so many things that abc would never approve of the first season on abc was too dark for abc and those were less dark than the syndicated episodes by season three that those 13 episodes abc wanted it turned down even more they suggested things like just getting rid of ray and making winston basically the driver oh yeah yeah do we need ghosts (laughs) uh but a big change they've successfully did one was slimming down Ray. Two was replacing Lorenzo Music. Replacing Lorenzo Music. That sucks. Uh, and they hired... Look, we all grew up loving Dave Coulier. Yeah. We like Dave Coulier. But he just does a lame-ass uh, Bill Murray impression. It's like doing the Caddyshack character. It's like, yeah, it's going, Ugh. everybody. And Bill Murray over here. It's, it's It sucks. It's awful. It's not how he talks in the yeah. movie. And it's also crazy that they went from making Venkman look so much unlike Bill Murray. And, you know, saying Venkman-style lines, but not in an explicitly Bill Murray delivery, to then hiring like the goofball from full house to just do an okay, but a silly Bill Murray impression. Uh, and they also in a real crime recast Janine and changed her to be a softer, more I motherly figure. Don't care for this. No, I mean, Janine was, so when I watched the show as a kid, I wanted Peter Venkman to be my dad <laughs> and I wanted Janine to be my wife, <laughs> <laughs> not your mom, not my mom. That was my first big cartoon crush. The, mm. uh, the more cool Janine. I think for a lot of, guys yeah i think uh, i mean she held her own in like fights that she she was forceful she had just cool big hair and sharp eyes yeah. uh, glasses and you know i liked how sexually forward she was in a kid's cartoon yeah. way of like egon why don't we spend some time together which was a takeoff on the movie as well yeah that's true and boy i love in the opening for the show that just slap of her palm onto the button it's so yeah. well done yeah she's she's so feisty she 
get yeah. spunk, as they said back in those days. She should uh, be their mommy. <laughs> yeah, so that again was the executive meddling. They were told like, no, 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 kids need a mommy. They don't need a mean woman <laughs> who like will step on them. <laughs> they So they changed all this <laughs> stuff. Plus they introduced characters, the junior Ghostbusters, which when... Oh, when I, fuck, I forgot yeah, about that crap. Yep. When I was seven, I knew that was stupid. I was like, no. Mm, I, was just, I, I was going to remark uh, how I was surprised they didn't add a kid character, but then they did. They did add kid characters. And also, they increased Slimer tenfold into the show and gave him a tail. Like, he elite, he before had a round butt. Yeah. But they gave him a Oof. tail. Like, they made even more Slimer, which, like, the reason you add comic relief to a show is to have a joke every now and then. But then if you're just going to turn it into the giant snotball show, then it's a completely different show. <sighs> but... That's what ABC wanted, and they were paying the big bucks. Straczynski actually quit the show in season. He tried to make it work in season three, was so frustrated by executive meddling, he quit the show for season four, and they beg him to come back for as the ratings were going down. So he came back to write a handful of episodes, but he did not want to be back as story Aww. editor. And uh, he even wrote a, I think it's a season six episode, that tries to explain why Janine was changed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where Janine looked looks in the mirror in the episode and sa- and gives herself the notes the network gave on her old look. And she was recast with Kath Susie, who she's good. I like Kath Susie, but it was just a sweeter, softer, non-Brooklyn voice, which is not the character Annie <laughs> Potts originated. One of the notes was like less ethnic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, the show got even, even kiddier in 89 when the movie debuted alongside Ecto Cooler as well. Oh boy. My little brother loved I was on, I always thought Ecto Cooler premiered with a cartoon, but it was for Ghostbusters 2 in 89, which, you know, went on to the cartoon as well. And it but. still exists, but not in Ecto Cooler form. It's like Tangerine. It went, even that went away for a time. And then Ecto Cooler came back with a 2016 movie. That's right. And now I think you can still just get it. Why but, did our parents uh, give us that shit? <laughs> Disgusting. Because uh, we were properly advertised to. And if we went to the grocery store with mommy, we point at it and say, gimme, gimme, gimme. Plenty of vitamin C and also 80 grams of sugar. <laughs> See, I was so indoctrinated by Kool-Aid, I would not drink high C. You were drinking even. the Kool-Aid, eh? I was. <laughs> I, I wanted tropical punch Kool-Aid. I would not accept mm. high C. That was not my brand. Purple Saurus Rex for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that Purple Saurus had so much fun. He looked more fun yeah. than Slimer. Also, Slimer is not, to me, an appetizing character. I don't want to drink something involved with Slimer. Yeah. All he does is put goo on people in the show. <laughs> That's some of the best comedy in real Ghostbusters is very Bankman bouncing off Slimer and being like, you little slime ball, I hate you. It's sort of like uh, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy, but if Shaggy hated Scooby-Doo. Yeah, totally. (laughs) But the show in 89 got rebranded as Slimer and the real Ghostbusters, including a whole Slimer subseries of episodes that basically didn't even feature the Ghostbusters and were just all Slimer all the time, which also extended to comic books that starred way more Slimer than the real Ghostbusters. Uh, Published in America by Now Comics and Marvel UK had their own Ghostbusters comics, which were not exactly canon, but they even had an episode or a comic in the UK that was a takeoff of Ragnarok and Roll. It was a continuation of one of the characters in Mm. this. Uh, And that continued until 1991, which... I was watching cartoons in 91 and Ghostbusters felt so old to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That which, was when the, the dawn of Nicktoons was upon us. Oh, yeah, yeah. So these toy-based cartoons are feeling really long in the tooth. One, and when you're a child, when you're 10, a four-year-old show may as well be an 800-year-old yeah, show. Yeah, it's like that was half my life ago. So it ran 173 episodes that's nuts yeah it, it's it's bonkers that it went that long another sin they did also to reuse some syndicated episodes abc picked a handful of them from the syndicated run but dubbed over lorenzo music uh, with dave coulier and and janine with kath susie it's uh it's evil that is that is wrong yeah. that is the book burning i yeah. <laughs> what is it, quit censoring lorenzo music yeah <laughs> 
but uh, by 1993, Deke sold off its catalog of shows to ABC. They got bought by ABC, which uh, then put them in a weird situation when ABC two years later was bought by Disney. And Disney didn't need an animation production company. They they handled that pretty much on their own. So Deke then decided to be spun off like they bought itself back. But Disney got to keep the library, which is why you got an Inspector Gadget Disney film. Oh, in interesting. Interesting. I wonder if this will be on Disney Plus. In well, Uh-oh. no, because by the end of the 90s, Columbia slash Sony uh. bought back Ghostbusters from Disney. It was always going to be a shared thing with them anyway if Disney had kept it. So they just were like, fuck it, Columbia, you, you're paying us the money, take it. Like, they own Ghostbusters. So at a certain point between 2004 and 1994, Columbia bought back the Ghostbusters, which is why they were selling DVDs of it from Time Life in the yeah, early 2000s. that's right. When they're like, we could sell one DVD for $50, right? Time Life was releasing odd things like Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that well, that was the start of TV on DVD. But thanks to that and Columbia's actual interest in this cartoon, it might be the most well-maintained and available of all 80s cartoon series. Yeah, I remember it came out on DVD when I was in grad school like 10 years ago and I watched a few of the DVDs and I really got back into it. And now it's all available. You can get the entire set for like $40, all wow. the episodes. I mean, wow. every DVD is cheaper than it's ever been. If you ever want a collection of something, mm. go on Amazon and get it now because who knows how long it'll be available for. Who knows how long any of the stuff will be streaming for. And it's all so cheap. I got all the kids in the hall for 20 bucks. Wow. In one box. Wow. They're all just in loose envelopes, but it's still <laughs> In the hall. <laughs> the, the box that they had that looked like the firehouse was really cool looking. Yeah. I was never going to pay that much for it. And they, they had a ton of extras. Like that JMS quote was from the extras. There's tons of extras on it there. Unfortunately, wasn't commentary for this episode, but Straczynski and a lot of the other writers recorded stuff for it and gave the real information. Like that's why I loved it too, that they got the real people who worked on it, not just trying to get like five minutes of Dan Aykroyd's time of like, what do you think of this cartoon you didn't work on? There was only one other continuation of this continuity of Ghostbusters, and that is the sequel from 1997, Extreme Ghostbusters, which uh, is a whole other episode. Yeah. It aired on the BKN, the Bobot Kids Network. Bobot. (laughs) But worth mentioning is that the two-part series finale, episodes 39 and 40, were called Back in the Saddle, where the rest of the real Ghostbusters Egon and Janine were regulars on the show, as were Slimer, but the rest weren't on it. And then for episodes 39 and 40, the final so- episodes, they brought back the real Ghostbusters, and they were all played by their second iteration selves. They brought back Frank Welker. They brought back Dave Coulier and uh, Buster Jones to do the voices of their original characters. I thought that series just looked terrible and it had the word extreme next to it, Mm -hmm. but it could be well written. Uh, I I have no idea. Maybe people in the comments can tell us if they watched it. It just felt like this is not the Ghostbusters I want (laughs) in my life. That is how it presented itself. I watched uh, actually the finale episodes last night to see how they did the real Ghostbusters. It wasn't bad. It was actually a good show. And I watched another one that uh, my husband was a viewer of it because he's eight years younger than me. So uh, he, he actually was an Extreme Ghostbusters viewer. We watched one. I couldn't believe it aired on TV. It was so bloody and grisly. Whoa. The idea of it was, what if R.L. Stein was controlled by the Cenobites? Whoa. Like, yeah. And it's, people are held down and chopped up and turned into zombies. The so at the end, they're magically put back to normal. Okay. But uh, it's, uh, at the very least, look up that Cenobite episode. It's pretty crazy. But that's an, that's an episode for another day. That, that was the final appearance of the real Ghostbusters in a new animated thing. And I'm glad they at least respect that there's a lot of love for it. It's, it was hard to go back and find things celebrating this because of the 2016 film. There were a lot of uh, yeah. jerk asses who talked up this show as uh, the good thing that was all uh. ruined 
owned by women or whatever. It's weird to uh, dislike that movie for good reasons. Mm-hmm. Like I just keep my mouth shut up. I've yeah. never, I've never seen it, so I am being a hypocrite. But everything I've read about it from non jerks, it's why I don't like any modern comedy. It's just mm-hmm. like it's not written. It's just like oh, just fuck around. We'll film it all. Yeah, that's the that's film the it problem. All. Like give it. Well, also I don't know. Hire a woman to direct this. What if you did that? Or hire somebody other than the. the it was just the Judd Apatow machine doing yeah. it again. Like it just it all feels that's the problem with it not the women the loose writing of it that doesn't make any fucking sense I, like, I when I watched the trailer I was looking up old tweets of mine because I thought I mentioned something about this show but I it must have been somewhere else but I looked up old tweets of mine and what really broke my uh, dashed my hopes against the rocks for that 2016 movie was a trailer um, Melissa McCarthy falls down because uh, Fatty Fall Down is her character yep and she goes oh that's gonna leave a mark it's uh, like the fucking check please it's yes, like it's like yeah. that's the level of humor we're operating She's at right right behind me isn't she yeah yeah, yeah. and it's ugh. it's just like ugh. I think that trailer actually did have a I think I just threw up in my mouth a little no yeah. she said it got everywhere in every orifice I'm like this is this is comedy now huh that's what to get mad about it not that women are in a thing like that's not the fucking pro you can't see ugh, yeah. yeah rope in your uh, actors people Though, uh, you know, in the future, finally, Ivan Reitman's son the, uh, will inherit Ghostbusters and give it back to the fans, as he said. Famous said. good guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I think it's also just great that, like, why hire a good director or, like, somebody who just made a good film? You hire the son of a person who made it mm-hmm. before. Just keep it in the family. That's how talent works. Yeah. It's in the blood. I can't wait in 2038 to see J.J. Abrams' son direct a Star Wars movie. That's going to uh-huh. be really great. That is 100% happening. He J.J. Abrams is writing a co- Spider-Man comic right now that is co-written by his son, and it's just to get his son into Shut the it down. industry. It's, it's happening. You can't stop it, Bob. And- it's... Uh, I, you might mention this, it might be in your notes, but is there going to be another Ghostbusters? Like, there's a talk about like another Ghostbusters movie with like uh, the old people in it? Or? That is the talk, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Je- uh, Ivan Reitman's son is supposed to direct it. Oh, that's like, the one that's, you're talking that's about. That's okay. the one. Yeah. Yes, yeah. He, he released a teaser trailer that was just the Ecto-1 in a barn, and that was it. Just just to say it's their intention, and seemingly they're going to get back all that, but they waited too long. Ramus is dead, and uh, you should blame Bill Murray for that. Bill yeah. Murray is a jerk who didn't do it, or just, just play the okay 2009 video game you know yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's all you need that's the perfect sequel that's ghostbusters 3 it's the ghostbusters 3 they should have made in 1992 with Alyssa milano even as the sexy damon yeah it's like i'll do you one better watch a let's play of that game oh yeah it's not a terrible it. game but it's not especially fun to play it's about to be re-released actually on uh the ps4 wow. and everything yeah, yeah you could play as the most generic white guy ever yes <laughs> yeah who, statistically uh, who they just uh they just recreated a producer on on the game too because why pay an actor yeah that's, that's, you're already spending all that money on that and on i couldn't believe they got bill murray in that like because he doesn't do that shit. it sounds like they all mostly care mostly and they might have gotten yeah. more than one line reading out of some of them there was a great bit of bill murray on david letterman around when the game was coming out of him saying you know i actually enjoyed it it was fun to record i was getting it back into the character i'm like yeah you fucking miserable asshole like this is fun you're good that's my uh, as someone who makes a lot of stuff of course i've never made anything as big as ghostbusters but it always frustrates me when people won't just do the things people li- like them for and like appreciate yeah just but- like no you're good at this do this thing uh, people want this yeah yeah like, but- yeah like joel Hodgson. like he he's doing it now like he learned like oh this is what people want me to do i'll do it mm-hmm. and then we're all happy again yeah i mean not that i like bill murray stuff that he's been doing yeah serious he's good at that too though he also i he sounds like he's a real piece of shit like yeah uh, but yeah but he's very funny i mean in that way he is like a dad too he, and he uh, was he not like my dad he was not too uh highfalutin to fucking play garfield exactly exactly i think though the story he told on letterman was really funny because he's leaving the recording he tells the story that he's leaving the recording and he's humming the ghostbuster song to himself because it's just so catchy and he says that somebody walked by him <laughs> and just shook their head like get over it man that uh, was years ago that but yes the the final indignity for lorenzo music is that he gets recast with a mm. bill murray impersonator and then bill fucking murray plays his Go- garfield doing an impression of his garfield 
Garfield. And then Frank Welker plays Garfield later. Yeah, yeah. Though now we're in a whole new era of Garfield. He just got bought by Viacom. Yeah. So I can't believe Jim Davis sold out. <laughs> it's like George Lucas selling to Disney, man. It's uh, But that's for a Garfield and Friends podcast that I'm sure to come mm-hmm. any day now. But uh, why don't we take a break? When we come back, we'll talk about the specific episode, Ragnarok and Roll. Ghosters will return after these messages. Darkest dream in the neighborhood. From the hit movie, The Real Ghostbusters. Together, Saturday, this fall on ABC. I'm afraid of no ghosts. Hey, it's Henry Gilbert here, lovingly squeezing my Stay Puff Marshmallow Man stuffed animal. Hey, it's Bob Mackey, and I still want Peter Venkman to be my dad. <laughs> and thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of What a Cartoon, where we talked all about the real Ghostbusters. And if you want to feel as good as busting feels to the <laughs> Ghostbusters, oh, yuck. you should support us on Patreon, because you'll get to hear next week's episode of What a Cartoon a week ahead of time and ad-free. But that is a small little morsel of what you would get. That's right. If you sign up at the $5 level, you'll also have access to all of our paywall podcasts at the $5 level. That includes all of our mini series to date that has been Talking Critic, Talking Futurama, Talking of the Hill, and our upcoming new mini series for this fall that patrons will vote on very soon. We also have many, many other podcasts at that level, including monthly community podcasts, season wrap ups, deleted scene specials, and so much more. If you've never been part of our Patreon before and sign up today, you'll have so much content to go through that you have never heard. I would say at this point, over 100 bonus podcasts that people probably haven't heard if they're only on the free feed. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of content. And you can also go to the premium level to get even more. At the $10 level, you get access to our monthly What a Cartoon movie podcast. It's just like What a Cartoon, but we talk about a different animated feature film once a month we just talked about the Rocco's Modern Life reboot Static Clang and we had so much fun digging into the dense references to classic Rocco all over the place and of course we really identified with the talk about nostalgia for old cartoons defining your life yes it's fun uh, and sad <laughs> and, uh, and that would be just the most recent one if you signed up now at the $10 level you get to hear all the previous ones including films like Akira, a goofy movie, the Aladdin, the real Aladdin uh, and tons 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 more, too many to list right now. You want to hear all of those, so please consider going up to that $10 a month level. And if you sign up today and have never used Patreon, it's super easy to fit our podcast into your podcasting life. Patreon gives you a code you always have access to, and you just drop that into whatever podcast player or app you use to access our podcast. It's very easy. I do it myself. But if you just want to use an exclusive app, you can just go to the Patreon app and listen to all of our bonus content that way. Either way you do it, it's super, super easy to do. And we have so many podcasts waiting for you at patreon.com slash talking simpsons so thanks again for listening now let's go back to the real ghostbusters and remember we are ready to believe you there's something strange in the neighborhood so who are you gonna call ghostbusters each sold separately have no fear Venkman, Steph, and Spangler are here. So are these ghosts. They've got ectoplasm. We've been gooped. Now what? Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Let's show this pile of dessert who's boss. Activate Neutrona Blaster. We ain't afraid of no ghosts. Peter Venkman, ectoplasm, Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, and other figures each sold separately. Ghostbusters, new from Kenner. We now return to the real Ghostbusters.
So we're back to talk about this week's episode of Ragnarok and Roll, which was from the syndicated run, the best run of episodes. And this is, uh, to many people, one of the best episodes. I saw this on many lists of best episodes of Ghostbusters. I think because it's one of the more serious ones and the less Slimer ones. Slimer has like a 0.5 seconds of screen time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get some noises just to remind you Slimer exists, but also it's like one of the most anime ones as well. Like uh, this, it doesn't say what studio because they don't have to credit studios, I think, because of KK Deke just subcontracted it all out. But my feel is that it has a bunch of Toei folks that worked on it. It feels very Toei. The biggest Toei shows, uh, you know, that came right after Ghostbusters were Dragon Ball and Sailor Moon. This has a bit of a feel of those to it. And there's definitely a few people in the credits on this who worked on Dragon Ball. Hmm, I think Dragon Ball was 86 the same year. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah, the first drag. I mean, what is a Kamehameha wave if not a proton pack beam? Oh, that's true. When you when you think about They're it. They're getting lots of practice in for drawing those awesome Kamehamehas. And I'm glad that the writers get credited on the title cards, which this is written by J. Michael Straczynski. But this is still a few years away from director getting same level credit, which I think wouldn't happen until the Spielberg Warner shows kind of mm. got that started. Though this show, these episodes don't have directors structurally in the sense that other animated series had directors like the director on all of these is apparently like for half of the shows was a man named Dan Schott but his uh, I think his job was more of just like an advisory type role I mean I think he was an animator too but it's not the same as having a David Silverman directed episode of yeah, The Simpsons it was really I mean it was done by Amazing Craftsman but I think it was more of an assembly line thing like people were mm-hmm. working on stuff out of order scenes out of order they were just told what was happening in them and given instructions you have to get 65 episodes out of yeah. Like it's, there's just no, there's no time for that kind of specificity than not in a non-union workhouse like Deke was as well. And so I think these shows were all very script driven. Like they came down on top from the script writers acted out by a very strong voice cast for the time. And then you just hand it out to whoever is available to take it and you stitch it together and call it a show. And I think that execution on this really does come from the Japanese side of things Mm -hmm. who are the producers producers on this there's there is one american storyboarder on it or at least i mean he has an american name he could live in japan for all i know but gordon harrison that's one of the credit ones but there most of the rest are guys like kazumi fukushima who worked on a ton of other oh. uh kids shows back then too. i'd love to just see the storyboards for these things yeah yeah we uh Oh man, our our friends Ian and Toby uh, at that Evangelion episode we did, they talked about how they're like, they just saw a Heathcliff, a Deke Heathcliff storyboard, or you'd see the storyboards from Deke produced Super Mario Brothers Super Show. And you're just like, this looks so good. How'd you <laughs> fuck this up? Like, but yes, this, uh, the intro to the show cuts in some of the stuff from the TMS pilot, specifically the, the Ghostbuster logo guy walking around the garbage Cans. I'm glad we finally get to see that ghost that is uh, so famously hated in the yes, logo. Yeah, and I love that ghost. I, though he also, I love his little like I love his strut down yeah, the street like, doo, 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 and doo, doo. the the, the real time animation like world moving behind him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's such a great shot that and the shot of the all the ghosts with Stay Puff at the top behind it and all the stuff with Stay yeah. Puff. That's also from the pilot. They just cut around Slimer. Slimer was in there too. There's actually if you love the cute little Slimer, you will feel sad seeing a terrified Slimer holding his hot dog getting zapped <laughs> like it you feel pretty bad for him if Good. you love Slimer uh, and also the shot in the opening that's so cool of all four oh, of them pulling yeah. out their basically guns all, all yeah. like in a line that's yeah. also just them recreating it in, from the pilot it's too. so beautiful yeah that and the opening all set to the to the ghostbuster song and it won't be the last time you hear that the but it is a cover of the ray parker jr song oh, it's not performed by him they oh. didn't want to pay for the actual song so that makes sense it's a sound alike i mean honestly i'm shocked that they even did that much money yeah but, uh, well the pilot is set to the full ray parker yeah. song too but yeah why pay ray parker if you look in the credits it says the performed by other 
other person. Ah, that's right. Yeah. Legally distinct. I mean, anybody can just say in a group, Ghostbusters. Yeah. That's all you really need. It's easy enough. And yeah, their proton packs are such anime lasers. Also, they put Venkman at the center of the shots because I think they, they thought of him as the lead character, but Egon is really the leader of the show. He, have, he affects the most change that happens. Like, pretty much everybody just looks at Egon like, Egon, what do you think? Explain this. Translate this ancient uh, script. Every title has to be a pun, so this is Ragnarok and Roll. It's a great pun. The, uh, the concept of Ragnarok was uh, not a billion dollar movie back then. Like, most people didn't know what it was. I think I knew by, I didn't know when I saw this episode as a kid, if I caught it in the in the runs, but by the 90s I knew it because I read Thor comics, but that's really the only reason. It was a very dorky reference then. Now it again was the name of the third Thor movie, and everybody mm-hmm. knows what Ragnarok is. The mountainside's like seriously evil. All of this stuff like very scary looking and not not jokey. ABC would not have approved of this uh, opening. And I like that we don't even get to the Ghostbusters until like three or four minutes in. Yeah, yeah. We we just spend time with Jeremy and Dottilio, a large, handsome man and his Igor-like companion. Uh, I think the and role from it comes that his character sounds like an Elvis impersonator, which is like the one flaw in this episode, I'd I, say. If, I don't know if they're fully going for that. I can see where you're coming from, but I, I can fix this for you in that if this was a live action thing, he would be played by Nicolas Cage. Okay. I thought of it in my head more oh, like Nicolas Cage, right. but it is a little mama. Like little Elvis. Yeah. Well, and the weirdest part, well, it's also distracting when it's Frank Welker because Frank, I know it, I, yeah. it just takes me out of it too. And there's a weird line where he's like, gonna go back to where it all began, my home, New York City. Yeah. That doesn't make no. He sounds like an authentic New Yorker, but it's like, New York City. They're like, what other voice can you do, Frank? Oh, that sounds yeah. fun. Let's do that. Yeah, I think it was just to have a fun voice, but it just, it feels a little disconnect from this simply tragic figure they create that he then has this kind of hunk of hunk of bird in love yeah. type voice. Like, he's not funny. The funny character is Dottilio. He gets all the joke lines. Uh, and Dottilio is named after a writer for Ghostbusters, Larry Dottilio, okay. who was very close friends with Straczynski. And a very ugly man, apparently. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, I, I have an overall theory that this is based on JMS, uh, and his J stands for Joseph, not Jeremy. I was going to say, so, wow. Uh, but JMS, I think he went through a bad breakup and uh, was channeling that and was also remembering that his friend Larry Dottilio told him, ah, forget that lady. Like everything, like be happy. Uh, sadly, Dottilio is no longer Aww. with us. He passed away in March of this year. JMS on his Facebook page actually posted a very sweet uh, story about working with hmm. them that they, that Dottilio is an uncredited mastermind of He-Man. He wrote a lot of the Bible for the series and the mythology of He-Man that people remember from the cartoon show that was invented for that not from the the toys they both quit he-man because they were being treated like shit and detilio told him like well all right this is a big risk and uh, you know i'm sicilian so if this doesn't work out and you you've ruined my career i'm gonna kill you <laughs> and uh, jms was like that's fair that's fair so detilio was rubbed out <laughs> uh detilio went i mean they were they worked a ton together it's a very it's a very sweet story but i think detilio actually you know taught jms how to be a story editor hmm. on these kind of shows cool. and, and build mythology but uh, but yes jeremy ha- has spoken but master jeremy the words i do not need them are inscribed within my heart and upon my soul well that must have been pretty painful i had a tattoo once myself and ah! no more time for jokes my friend this is it wish me luck Ash Nazig Durab Tulak. Ash Nazig Gimbal Tul. Ash Nazig Thraka Tulak. Ag Burza Mishi Krimpatul Yura Kazat Kazadam Kazadam So one thing I noticed about this show upon revisiting it is because this show is, uh, you know, animated in Japan, edited in Japan, like everything is done production wise in Japan. It is uh, very anime in that there are moments of silence, mm, you know, yes, it's not yeah. constant wall to wall music as <laughs> our, all of our loud shows would be in the 90s. Yeah, like Bobby's World yeah. or, or uh, Ren and Stimpy. It's just like you can't you can't give children a moment to think this. Yeah, you're right. It definitely has more anime pacing like but sometimes that that hurts the comedic speed of uh, some gags in the 
show. Yeah. I like though that Jer that uh, Dottilio is like, you know, I had a tattoo once. It's like, stop, no more yeah. jokes. But also very anime was Jeremy pulling out his photo of Cindy and yeah. the wind blowing it away. Speaking of things like Ragnarok that were very geeky in 1986 and nobody had heard of, uh, that incantation he made is that as well. I don't know if you you I only found this from research. Oh no, what is it? Well. Most people would know that incantation not in the speaking tongue of Mordor, oh. but said in the common languages of Middle Earth as one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, and one ring in the darkness bind them. I fucked that up slightly, but what he's saying it is the one ring inscription that is on oh, okay. the ring of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I was wondering if it meant anything. But he's saying it in the dark tongue, the black tongue of Mordor, and which Gandalf said in the film which i was gonna play a clip of that but everybody speaks over it so it's uh, it's not a good clip so instead i found some nerd on youtube <laughs> saying it in the dark tongue so this is what the it sounds like when you're not saying it like how elvis would say <laughs> the incantation <laughs> You can hear it's it is a little uh, gummed up there, but you can hear like the Ajnaz Kazoo like Ajnaz is one ring. Like uh, that's a really nerdy deep cut. Yeah, I again for uh, all these fucking dorks and they're these Tol- Tolkien dorks. So they did I didn't realize they were giving us all that. And also the Kazadun Kazadun thing he says at the end. That is the location of the Mines of Moria. Oh which man, is, uh, yeah, <laughs> come on, really, really dorky enough. Shit <laughs> <laughs> so you have the. These nerds of the 70s writing in Tolkien stuff into their Ghostbusters anime. I do it. Here. And speaking of anime, man, the red light from the sky yeah. that surrounds him and the way the thing flies into the ground, it all is so anime. And his, his transformation into this like gray David Bowie-like figure. Oh man, I love the design on his creepy form, whatever he turns yeah. into. It, re- it actually reminds me of the red eyes that we just did a couple weeks yeah, ago. The yeah. villain in that too. Just he has such an alien look to him in his you know overcoat and stuff he's so cool looking and yeah i i love his redesign while he stood next to this just you know 1940s igor style character of detilio uh him saying i have the power to end the world he plays his flute that it made me laugh it did though i i like the flute conceit yeah it's cool it's spooky and the destruction of the mountain too like man it's it's moving background paintings like it's a painted element moving uh like in background style which you know that's a nice little extra effort there i i really like that i mean good on the japanese production side of this that we're told like well this is the end of the world so you're gonna have to do a lot of gigantic destruction yeah. in this episode there's also a very a very anime technique later we see of like very well done drawings you do this pan across uh, where yeah. nothing is moving but they're also very well done drawings yes uh yes but jeremy has the power to end the world. Master Jeremy, must we? That is, there must be another way. You know better than that. The world is a cold, heartless place. It's hurt you and it's hurt me, but no more. For now I have the power to tell you. The power to end the world. Not yet. Not yet. First, I must send back some emissaries to Tilio. Then we'll go home. My home, where the pain started. <laughs> home to New York. Love that sound effect. Too. Yeah, and it struck me how they keep using the word emissaries and for a kids' <laughs> cartoon in the eighties. Yeah. They could have said messengers or minions or henchmen or whatever or monsters, but they just said emissaries. It is uh, this and. Yeah, the, the, it's, it's such fancy language for, again, this like twangy, dark magician to use as well. Though, you know, now recording this after a bunch of mass shootings, oh, no. 
Well, I do. His reasoning is that of a mass murderer in real, like, like he's mad a girl broke up with him, so he's going to kill everybody. Yeah, like, it, it is. Uh, it's it's been a constant problem. It's uh, it's a le- it makes him less likable to yeah. me, I think too. And uh, so that cut there, that sound effect was the Ghostbusters logo going across the screen as we head over to a New ghost York. wipe. It's a cool shot too of like you're seeing New York in his glassy eyes, and then it goes to New York and. Later in the episode, we'll see him getting off a boat, which it's it's funny that Fluke gives him the power to destroy the world, but not to teleport or fly he's, or anything. He's got to book tickets on a boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, uh, that's we- he would look like quite a weirdo on his, I would guess that's across the Atlantic, that trip. Mm, yeah. So, but he is sending his emissaries, which are some really cool design, just like straight up scary goblins. Like S&M gargoyles. They have like spiked <laughs> speedos on. And uh, that's how the Ghostbusters are introduced. They're just fighting these guys. And in the few episodes I, I watched around in here, one thing that bugs me is that the proton packs have to never work because that would end the episode too soon. So there's always these scenes of the Ghostbusters going like, man, the proton beams aren't working. What are we going to do? That's always the mystery. Like, how do we find the frequency or what else? What other trick do we need to do? So many recalibration scenes. It's just a whole lot of re- and reversing polarities. And maybe this was the first cartoon where I heard about reversing polarities, which also that just sounds like star trek guys like uh which actually there's an episode in the first years written by the writer of the tribbles episode oh wow yeah there's a lot of techno babble in this (laughs) from egon uh well i mean this is straczynski will go on to make babylon 5 so this is just that's the type of guy he is but when we finally meet the ghostbusters we get our first of many very funny lorenzo music scenes how come the particle beams never work on those whatever they are you've been buying discount protons again egon I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Come on. Egon doesn't like it. This does not sound good. Here. Psychokinetic energy readings are skyrocketing all over the world with frightening speed. But the heart of the phenomenon is right here in New York. Hey, New York's a happening kind of place. Tourists love us. Yeah. I just wish we knew what kind of tourists could do all this. I love that exchange because it totally feels like Murray and Aykroyd playing off each other in the movie. Yeah, going back to these episodes, I like how uh, figured out the characters are and their dynamic between each other. Uh, They're actually people. Yeah. They have really strong personalities. Yeah, they all, Straczynski and his guys, they knew, they got the writing of the movie that made the character interactions work so well. That's why they always have funny exchanges. Like, you need Venkman to say something funny. You need Ray to kind of not get it. You need Egon to be annoyed at Venkman. And you uh, you need Winston to be there. And he's, he's the regular guy who's just yeah. like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, I do love that. He, I uh, That's what that's where his uh, Winston Zedmore's best scenes in the film too in the 84 film so uh, him just listening to Venkman say like this is not good or just like we him saying uh, that I love his tourist line like I could absolutely hear Bill Murray giving a similar delivery and we're in the era of scary New York yes yeah yeah that's when you see the New York in this and the crazies walking around you're like there you just know they are walking by so many porno theaters in this <laughs> too and breathing the they I mean they should explode Trump Tower while they're yeah. there as well but what can you do what can you do but yeah i also like the just the shot of them driving around in ecto one and then we get back to uh spook central as janine constantly calls it the firehouse and uh we get a we get a fun little janine scene here too i hope you're satisfied egon do you have any idea how many times i stuck my finger while putting in those silly stick pins 12 tough going janine old girl but don't worry as soon as we can we'll get you to a vet (laughs) <laughs> Egon! You say you transplant his brain into a chicken next time he made fun of me. Those pins, they mark each of our assignments over the last four days, don't they? Yes, it forms a definite pattern. There may be something very significant at the center of the star's hub. It's a house. 427 South 15th Street, right here. 
So it's a pentagram. Yeah. Uh, well, they a can't star. say that. It's a, it's a star at yeah. a different angle. That, but yeah, that's uh, kind of all that you get. One other Slimer scene in this episode, but that's it. I'd, I wanted to get that in there just so people could hear the... Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I prefer that to... Uh, I don't know. Would you rather that or Howie Mandel's sounds? Like, oh, which, uh, I think uh, I'd go with current Slimer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I, he also even sounds like he says words later in this one but they i this is how you should treat slimer is just like i ignore you like, yeah I, we have a story to tell slimer. i mean he's like a less intelligible scooby-doo like you're kind of supposed to know what scooby is saying with slimer <laughs> like it, it kind of can lead you to words but not really and that antagonistic relationship between vankman and janine that's so funny mm-hmm. like him saying he'll take her to the vet and he's like egon you said you do this like that uh she's she's spunky but yeah that uh man hearing that stuff I, I forgot I had a clip for of Dave Coulier's much more inferior. Uh, hey, why don't you play it, Henry? Yeah. <laughs> well, double the pleasure, double the fun. Yeah. And your little dog, too. <laughs> Just wait till your father gets home and sees this mess. Hey, double the pleasure. It's so, it's, it's so <laughs> easy yeah. to do. I know. He's... Uh, I mean, that's Dave Coulier's whole thing. He was man. told to do He's, that. Yeah, but he was told to do it. It, he, it just sucks. There's uh, there's also a real funny clip out there that you can find of Dave Coulier in an amazing 90s cool guy outfit of like a Kango and a uh-huh. uh, Letterman jacket. He goes on Arsenio and he brings up that he, he Arsenio worked on one season with Coulier. So he's like, guys, I work with Arsenio on real Ghostbusters. And Arsenio is just like shaking uh-huh. his head like, yeah, okay, look, I, yeah, I was Winston. Anyway, like he doesn't want to talk about it, but Coulier is like, no, come on, cartoons. And the audience, because they're not fucking dorks, they're cool people of the early 90s they don't give a shit about this and dave coulier was like mr boomer cartoon guy yeah yeah he talks about he's like oh yeah i work with mel blank dawes butler no reaction no one cares Did he, like, i bet he pulled out a good bullwinkle impression right yeah i couldn't stand to li- watch yeah. more of it after that honestly <laughs> i don't want to be too mean to dave coulier he's but he is like his job was to be a cheaper robin williams that was that was his need. i never thought of it like that but you're right <laughs> he came up after robin williams he basically did all that like there's you know i haven't watched our friend of the show knickknacks on out of control out of control yeah it's, i want to call it the cut it out show it's but, very yeah. very good like all of their uh, videos he uh yeah knickknacks shared a, a clip from it of Hodgson on it, Joel Hodgson. Yeah. He gets hit in the head like hard with yeah. something. I feel really it bad. It was so weird him. to see uh, Joel Hodgson enter the realm of Dave Coulier. And where he's subservient to Dave Coulier, like that, I hated that dynamic too. I, uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, the I think JMS and the other writers with the kind of snappy dialogue there, I think they were showing off for the SNL guys. I think they mm. were thinking like, what if Dan Aykroyd saw this and he wanted to hire me because I'm so funny. Also, when they say the like, what kind of tourists go... Uh, what kind of tourists, as Ray says, they then cut to Jeremy and Dottilio arriving in New yeah. York. The scene there with Janine and Egon, that was the real ship for viewers of the show. Like they, they dreamed of Janine and Egon being together, you know? I uh, never loved her more than when she became a Ghostbuster briefly in the cartoon. That was cool. Yeah. That was so cool. Yeah. I, I, and I, I like on the show that they, I agree in the films that I think movie Egon is an entirely asexual being and cares yeah. nothing for other humans honestly but tv a cartoon egon i do think loves janine in his way and i think you know for a generation of dorks the relationship between a you know kind of nerdy but feisty and sexually interested woman and a big nerd who doesn't <laughs> understand that she has a crush on him i think that really spoke to a generation oh, of yeah. nerds you know it was our rogue and gambit <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this episode has one of Janine and Egon Shipper's favorite moments. Oh, you're right. Even too, as, as I found online. That even continues into Extreme Ghostbusters. Like, they're not officially a couple, but they spend so much time together and they live together alone in the firehouse that it makes me think that they are as much a couple as they can. What's be. going on when those extreme guys aren't around? <laughs> they then head over to a uh, location. That's where they meet Cindy, who's played by Lynn Ann Leverage. Mm. And she is mainly a live action actress who just does like one-off 
appearances in like Roseanne or Sybil or uh, even shows up until pretty recently. She's not a voice actress per se, which I think is why you get more naturalistic acting here. I think this is lessons, you know, if Bruce Tim was paying attention, he's like, this is better. This voice acting isn't as good as in Batman. No way. Mm -hmm. But it's better than He-Man and other shows at the time that I think they were learning how to get more natural acting. Oh, for sure. Yeah. This was definitely not the Hanna-Barbera school of voice acting in the show, except for Frank Welker. Frank Welker is that. Everybody else, at least for Slimer, everybody else is a more realistic Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Frank Welker does a great job, but he is doing more of a cartoon performance, Mm -hmm. even as Ray, when everyone else is a little more low key. But he was told to be snarf. Like yeah. he's like, yeah, he's he's working on Transformers and GI Joe at the exact same time. It's just how he thinks, you know. Cindy then informs us about her history with Jeremy. His name is Jeremy Whittington. He wanted to marry me, but I, I just well, I have a career to establish. It isn't the right time yet to settle down. Who's his friend? That's Detilio. Jeremy saved him from being run down by a car. He's been Jeremy's loyal companion ever since. Okay, so what has all this got to do with us and all these attacks? When we broke up, Jeremy took it pretty hard. He went a little, well... Nuts, bonkers, wonkies, loopy, loony, crackers? I think we get the idea. (laughs) Go ahead, pay no attention to him. We never do. He disappeared for a long time. Then I got a letter from him today. He predicted everything that's been happening. He said there was much too much pain in the world to let it continue. He enclosed this, but I don't know what it says. Jeremy said there are only three people in the world who can decipher it. Is there any point in asking? (laughs) Not really. Can I see it? (laughs) It's just one word, Ragnarok. Hmm, I wonder. I really love that gag. By this point in the show, they all know, like, Egon knows everything. I'll just get Homer Simpson. (laughs) Ray is even kind of... It's something that makes Ray... I can see why they thought about cutting Ray, because he should also be a science guy in the show, but he, a lot of the time, has nothing, because Egon just fills that story component. He does get to be like the excitable nerd. I like that. There's a yeah. great moment in here where the you get the feel of the one of the best Ray scenes in the 84 film is him sliding down the pole and going like, oh, I love this place. We got to get this right now. Come on. Like that. He's the kid. He's the big kid. That's that's what the dynamic is that like Peter is dad, Egon is mom, hmm. and Ray is the kid. Like and Winston is the driver. <laughs> he's their their butler. Okay. They, they hire their butler. They, their, their manservant sounds too harsh. I won't say that. We do hear about <laughs> Jeremy's manservant and their yeah. backstory. Okay, so this, uh, this feels like, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking, but loyal companion they're always together like yeah i think jeremy's mistake is that he is not in love with cindy he's in love with detilio maybe uh, i think that car story is a cover-up i think jeremy mm-hmm. i think detilio knows about this uh, ancient mythology yeah yeah the, it's detilio is not fleshed out enough it just sounds like he's a ugly man who was hurt by people and jeremy liked him but i could see him getting into that kind of occult stuff and Jeremy is definitely like an anime slash JRPG villain where it's like, this world is so corrupt and dirty. I must destroy it. <laughs> he so is. You're yeah. right. Yeah. The the uh, Except he's spurred on by hating a woman for rejecting him, which, again, her, her explanation feels so Hollywood to me. Oh, yeah. That's, again, why it feels like JMS getting back at an ex who was <laughs> like, I have to focus on my career now. I could be an actress. It's he's so like, broad. It, <laughs> yeah. She doesn't even say actress, does she? No. She just says, to focus on my career and that's it whatever that career may be yeah i mean it is paying for like a brownstone in new york yeah manhattan so pretty nice so maybe in 86 that was more affordable i don't know but i would assume she's broadway or something she's Mm. she's also anime's interpretation of an aryan princess yeah a very pretty blonde woman Mm -hmm. with flowing hair and big eyes big blue eyes like cindy's so nice and they they do also keep in a bit of the venkman uh is a skirt chaser every time they meet a yeah. Cute girl he always is hitting on her. it's toned down a bit in the se- in the series of course mm-hmm. uh, but it's still there 
Yeah, and I, I love that Egon constantly is shutting down Venkman, like, just don't pay attention to him, <laughs> we don't. But uh, yes, the the script just says Ragnarok, which that's a lot of letters to, to say Ragnarok, but... Uh, He's paraphrasing. <laughs> uh, and he then pulls out his EPK meter. It explodes, overloaded with energy, and he has to throw it out the window. I believe it's uh, PKE. PKE. I think you're thinking e. of electronic press kits. Sorry, PKE. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been saying it wrong this whole time. Forgive me, listen. It's okay. It's okay. It's PKE. like that, that thing should not be able to explode that uh yes that hugely as ray says that it's it's way past a class five ghoul that's for sure yeah you can see like later the crater the pke meter lives behind <laughs> they are very lucky that on the crowded streets of manhattan no one was within 40 feet of that house when they threw that out there but that lets you see the danger involved too but all that exploding glass i was thinking the same like oh boy, yeah all the glass they wouldn't get away with that even like two three years later yeah. in a syndicated show can't the window be open? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's the kind of notes ABC would give them that Deke for syndication wasn't giving them. Man, yeah, I wrote EPK all through my notes. That's uh, EPK is a thing that we know. Yes. It's yeah, a real I, thing. Uh, but uh, PKE, PKE. I think it's psychokinetic energy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and yes, yeah, so the uh, as they're reflecting on the explosion, the world is ending. Is all your equipment this dangerous? Oh, no, no. Well, actually it is. But we're all very well trained. We haven't blown up a house in days. Yeah, Janine, what is it? Have you guys been watching TV? If not, Winston, I suggest you find one fast. All heck's breaking out. Ah. Doesn't look good, does it? Come on. Reporting unparalleled destruction all over the world. Survivors have been quoted as saying that it was as if nature had turned against mankind. I believe Slimer is saying end of the world. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, yes. but the yeah. second thing, I don't know what he said. <laughs> Those are millions of deaths right there that you're yeah, just seeing. Yeah, yeah, it should be it's pretty big news. But yeah, we get the nice like anime style pans across very well detailed drawings of destruction. Ah, uh, beautiful, beautiful. Like, yeah, that that tidal wave and then just one of those uh, classic painting style things you just pan across that are, uh, you know, it's like the last hit in an anime show or whatever, but it's this destruction. I I had forgotten to say the uh, good Janine, that was Laura Summer. Okay. That's, uh, she's really great. She did interviews for the DVDs where she talked about that. While she was definitely influenced by Annie Potts's portrayal, she actually was more channeling her own Brooklyn mom oh, cool. to play the character, which, uh, man, it's so bullshit they recast her like uh but yeah when winston pulls out his walkie-talkie for a second i did think like is that an iphone what's, uh, what's there but i love fucking lorenzo music's reply there just like oh no well actually yes like uh, but we haven't destroyed a house in days like that's that's a funny line that he makes uh, incredible. Yeah, there's the reason he's Garfield. <laughs> yeah. Who's God. the cat version of Peter Venkman. Irreplaceable. Irrepla- it's why they haven't replaced him in the last uh, 18 years. And uh, yeah, Jeremy is killing millions of people here, which to spoil the ending, when you see all this destruction, I know they can't do it because it's a kid show. Even if the guy undoes everything, for the cosmic scales to feel just, he needs to die. Yeah, yeah. It's unfair that he is able to be like redeemed. Fully redeemed. Yeah. yeah, he kills every. And I mean, even if you undo it, all the suffering you caused isn't undone like that. But it's a kid show. You can't kill off the villain in that case. But I feel like even in a Batman show, you know, five years later, they would have at least had him swallowed up as well. Or they'd be like, is he dead? Like, it would be one of those kind of endings instead of a fully happy ending he gets. But when you see all this destruction and the news reporter talking about like the cities are gone, yeah. like it's Mother Nature's turned against us. It uh, it really makes you hate Jeremy and not really give a shit about his girlfriend problems. Uh, there's also a cute little thing that the uh, the newsman's mic says Deke on it. Oh, you're right. Yep, yep. Little advertisement. And uh, you know, when I was a kid, this stuff like end of the world shit, as uh, as Ray would talk about, that stuff really scared me as a kid. The idea yeah. that there could be an apocalypse really scared me. That's why shows like this were fascinating to me uh, mm-hmm. because of all the big, heavy topics they would handle, like the 
end of the world and the afterlife and things like that. Just like my brain was getting ready to finally confront them. <laughs> now I have much more grounded fears and that, I mean, honestly, the, the Ragnarok, I'd be, I would welcome it at some yeah. days. I love my life, I, all that stuff. Some days I still welcome Ragnarok, but, uh, and yeah, fun, also with Ragnarok being mentioned, JMS would actually go on to write a very influential for the films Thor comic book run in oh, the really? mid 2000s. So he's well versed in Ragnarok at this point. As the Ghostbusters are walking outside, when they showed a shot of their shoes, it hit me like, these are Lupin shoes. They made oh, their character designs Lupin shoes. Interesting. Like it is the flat black shoe with a bump on the end of it, yeah. just like Lupin or Spike Spiegel has. Hmm. So we go to commercial break with finding out that they might not be able to end the end of the world. Egon, what is it? What's going on? Ragnarok. Looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah, what's Ragnarok? I mean, that's the word on the letter, right? Ragnarok. Armageddon. There are lots of words for it, but they all add up to the same thing. The end of the world, Winston. Somehow, somebody set in motion the process that will lead to the end of the world. Oh my gosh, Jeremy! But you can't stop him, can't you? If we can find him in time, and if we're not already too late, it doesn't look good. I guess Winston is the guy you need to explain things to. Yeah, yeah. In English, dog. <laughs> now, I mean, that is a um, slightly racially loaded thing, especially people brought that up in the 2016 movie, too. They're like, you know, Leslie Jones is great at playing the everyman of the group, but it is something like, well, you have one black character and they're the one who doesn't understand anything because they have, have to explain things. Street to. smarts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The concept of street smarts even sounds a little racially yeah. motivated, too. When, yeah. When I watch the movie again, for the first time in a long time like in the late aughts I noticed like the mistreatment of Winston was just really underlined in my brain but I also noticed like he was the first one to sell them out like he tries to sell them out immediately when he's in prison I do not know these yeah. people yeah I just work here yeah didn't like that yeah. didn't like that line I do like his line of like, hey, you pay me, I'll believe whatever you want. That stance of him is great. And like the working man. And he gets to have the big like outro line of like, I love this town. He's the final line of the movie. I mean, the best parts of Ghostbusters 2 is that they give him a much, much bigger role and Mm -hmm. a lot of really great lines. I believe in the 2009 game, he is back to being marginalized. (laughs) But Arsenio does a great job with this. It's just kind of a, uh, especially in this episode, it is not a Winston episode. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. I mean, this is is a jeremy episode like the ghostbusters are almost secondary figures in their series he gets a lot of screen time man that's a commercial break to go out on it like well the end of the world's coming i don't think we can stop him <laughs> better keep watching kids like that and that's when you would get the frank welker voiced commercial break like the ghostbusters will be right back just some uh, random character we've never met uh, it was actually the logo talking oh like he would okay voice the logo at least in the we'll be right backs i found and Of course, because they aired on ABC, those wouldn't air because they'd have after these messages. Oh, right. Those are anime style eye catches. Like the the logo would do different things, right? Yeah. Yeah, Wow. Uh, It was made just like a goddamn anime. (laughs) This is why we loved anime because we were trained to by our favorite cartoons. Our favorite cartoons were just anime. That was that was the best parts of Heathcliff, which I I can't wait to get to the Deke Cliff uh, Mm. shows. Never will I do the Ruby Spears Heathcliffs. At least Deke. Heathcliff's has a Cadillac cats who were way cooler yeah. than Heathcliff. Hot anime cats. <laughs> God, I didn't even know there was a Ruby Spears Heathcliff. Yeah. Again, this uh, was kept from me. I'm glad. Those, I only found that out in my Ruby Spears research. I was like, thank God the slightly better Deke Heathcliff's replaced Ruby Spears ones in airplay. Uh, but yeah, so they go to commercial break on there. We come back to them walking the streets of New York and uh, there's a cute little gag of them running into one of those end is near sign guys who's trying to scam them and then when he's told like no the end really is here he's he goes like i gotta get another job rip, rip. some nice levity yeah the, the pacing i didn't have the clip because there's such a long pause yeah yeah there's a lot of air between the lines sometimes and uh, there's also a funny inside gag where behind them is the abc theater playing ghostbusters yeah. which uh, in the universe of the show if you watch the episode take two from uh, the first years of the show the the Ghostbusters film exists within this show. That's right. Yeah. They, uh, they did one other episode that is the bridge from the movie to here where basically they come back in their old uniforms 
covered in Stay Puff marshmallow goo. And then they're told, oh, we got you new outfits in. And it's about them rebuilding and resetting things up and where and getting rid of their old outfits. Hmm. Uh, and then in the episode take two, they find out that a movie starring the people who are the stars of Ghostbusters is being made in their world. And there's actually a cameo by Dan Aykroyd uncredited as a producer talking to Wow, him. really? Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so this is just a continuation of that. The Ghostbusters film that that exists within real Ghostbusters is playing. And uh, I think too, they're talking, uh, taking a bit from the movie with how they have to reach the top of a building where ominous clouds are forming too. I definitely got some echoes of the movie. A lot of Gozer right yeah. there too. They're no Stay Puffed and the Stay Puff appeared a lot in the cartoon because they probably knew from focus groups that kids love the Stay Puff yeah. Marshmallow Man. He was a, a huge toy in that he was uh, yeah. very popular and also a big toy. Yes, yeah, I had that toy. I had to stay puffed. He was nice and smooth, too. That's why, as a kid who wanted to put a toy in my mouth, I preferred <laughs> that. Plus, He-Man's could be too pointy. I just hate marshmallows. <laughs> as they're exploring through the city, though, we have some fun, almost pinky in the brain style interactions between Dottilio and Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, which is extra funny because Maurice LaMarche is the brain, though he's playing the pinky in this scenario. And uh, when Jeremy finally decides it's time to destroy everything, he has the most anime power up ever. He is a oh, yeah. blue glowing man. He may as well be going Super Saiyan. I mean, I would think the same animators who did keep like as in K-I, key blasts uh, uh, for Dragon Ball at the same time, we're drawing this and using the same techniques. The, yes, Jeremy is really messing stuff up. Depends, I guess, on how sick your idea of fun is. I, oops. Did you say something to Tilio? No, Master. Honestly, you alone have my loyalty, my trust, my heart, my throat. See to it that you remember that. I spared the city the worst until I could arrive to oversee it personally. Now there's no longer reason to delay. Come to me, my emissaries. Reveal yourselves at last! Over there! The Carstairs building? Gotta be. Egon? That's it. He's got to be up there. Come on! Back to the car, fast! And to think... This used to be such a nice neighborhood. <laughs> Totilio is sarcastic and terrified. <laughs> my throat. My yeah. yeah. <laughs> he uh, very funny. I mean, Maurice LaMarche is such a funny voice actor. This is the, the comedy chops he's showing off here, which is why he works so well on Futurama. He like, was also on a lot of other Deke shows like Inspector Gadget. Yeah. He was the chief. And I believe he took over for uh, Phil Hartman and Dennis the Menace as Mr. Wilson. That's right. Yeah. yeah. He was an early Deke favorite. I think those were some of his first jobs in mm -hmm. La La. Uh, land after he after he left uh the the bright shores of canada to to work in la his mistake uh, his mistake <laughs> you, you're doing it backwards there yeah also all the explosions through the neighborhood and all that stuff like so anime like and and the uh, the the people like if you just showed the scene of the monsters chasing bystanders down the street and said this was from devil man or whatever people would yeah. just believe it yeah like it just looks like anime uh and i i do love just his line about like oh, this used to be such a nice neighborhood like just so fuck it's a, you can't even do a music impersonation because yeah it not even like frank welker could do it yeah it because you have to do it flat you have to be like this used to be such a nice neighborhood but you can't infuse the amount of personality into that flatness that music was so good at. his voice was so unique it's it's amazing uh, still gone since 2001. Yeah. Uh, we miss it. It's a shame. But uh, uh, the emissaries come back and they're just like Prince of Space because uh, their weapons are worthless <laughs> against them. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? <laughs> Prince of Space. But yeah, Crankor, the, right? <laughs> Crankor, yeah. They, there's, they're not unlike Crankor. Yeah. Yes. Like the, yeah, those, uh, the monsters are really great designs there too. The But yeah, their proton packs just bounce right off of them. But fortunately, they're lucky that they aren't really trying to kill them. They're more just laughing at them. Them. Like that's that's why it's good that Ray says 
they're laughing at us. They're not even really trying to kill us. They're they're just having fun because those emissaries are not the people who are going to kill everybody. It's it's just lightning and earthquakes. Yeah, it's, they they don't really do much. And they realize they have to attack uh, Jeremy. He's the leader. And man, the background art on destroyed Manhattan is amazing. Oh, it's so dark and creepy. It's they, so well done. They worked really hard on that. And there's there's another great joke right after this about how all all that destruction everywhere, but Ray's mind is only on one thing. It's another one of those bad things. You were right, Egon. They are connected to all this. Be right later. For now, that that thing hurt Ecto-1. The world's being destroyed and he worries about Ecto-1. We must speak to him later about his priorities. (laughs) If there is a later. You know, you're really no fun anymore. It's circling around for another pass. Get it. That's classic rave. Just like, he heard Ecto-1. Just think of uh, that shot of Dan Aykroyd being rolled up from under Ecto-1 with a cigarette in his mouth. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Always work under a car with a lit cigarette. They smoke so much in that movie. I noticed that too. Like, everybody's smoking. This is not like, oh, this is the character that smokes. Like, no, everyone has cigarettes constantly. It's just normal. Yeah, it's, it's just... 1980. Put a cigarette out wherever you want. I mean, uh, partially they are playing themselves in it or versions of themselves. And that also is like, they were smoking like chimneys working together to write this movie yeah. you know so it just felt normal uh and uh, just the same as eating the all the twinkies they eat in the movie same deal uh, but yeah the destruction of ecto-1 they also they work real hard to make ecto-1 look super cool so you'll buy the toy and i did own oh, an man. ecto-1 i, I kind of want one now doing all these commer- <laughs> doing all these what a cartoons i kind of want to just go on ebay and buy a bunch of crap <laughs> see when i see all these toys it also reminds me that i hated toys like ghostbusters or he-man would sell like the goo the monster goo of like cover your guys in goo i'm like i love my toys yeah. i don't want to cover them in goo what's the cleanup process like exactly well yeah. that's for mom to deal with oh like, one of my know. friends had the big firehouse i was so jealous even though i wasn't a toy boy i was like i just want to play with the thing <laughs> i i did not have the firehouse the only oh, one of it was those glorious the only one of those giant sets i had was uh gray skull i had mm, castle gray he had that too that's yeah. son of a bitch <laughs> boy he sounds even more spoiled than i was mm. but yeah the ecto one the doors in the back even open on it it looks so cool and this show perfectly advertised why the ecto-1 mm, was cool and why I, you'd want all your guys to sit in like it. i said i want to buy one now <laughs> so they they decide that uh, these lasers just aren't working they have to like recalibrate their ionization rate for the protons and that'll take days that they don't have so instead they got to go to the source and take out jeremy and when you see the shot of all of new york destroyed i will say it is an unintentionally eerie that the world trade center is still standing yeah yeah <laughs> That was also distracting when I watched the real Ghostbusters crossover episodes of Extreme Ghostbusters because in the first part, New York gets destroyed by the Bermuda Triangle, like erasing things kind of stuff. And that happens to the World Trade Center. It gets covered in stuff and disappears. Mm. It actually looks very similar to the um, it being disassembled in Super Mario Brothers, the oh, movie. Oh, what a shocking shot that turned into. <laughs> yes, yeah, which that Extreme Ghostbusters was done in 1997. They had no clue who would have had a clue then you know in, but, yeah in that mario brothers movie uh the rift tracks version of it the one you can download they just cut that part out it's oh, like we're good. not gonna make a joke about this i see i like yeah. that rift tracks is selective like that you know they just they know it is just gonna make you uncomfortable and not give you the kind of laugh they know there's a line i like that rift tracks i think you know um mike nelson can be a bit of a moralizer sometimes yeah. but i do like i like choices like that but we've talked about mystery science theater a lot on this but yes we go back to jeremy at the top and he has uh his plan is just about done i don't know jeremy i'm scared there is no need for fear my friend we alone will go on but we serve the darkness that will follow so don't worry i don't know i i mean it had its problems but does the world really deserve this it was really beautiful in places i I kind of liked it. That's him. That's him. Let's get him. Get him. Right. That's the guy. Okay. Fire. No, wait. Hello, Cindy. Please, let me talk to him. Hey, I say, what good are we if we can't bring a couple of kids together in this crazy world, eh? Besides... The beams aren't working anyway. 
<laughs> I guess they had to try the beams, but why would the mm. beams work on Jeremy if they didn't work on the emissaries? Yeah, but it's well, the I same mean, ghost energy, right? I don't know. Well, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you know, they got to They they were right to try it, but uh, but that shows you like Venkman's what he gives to the group is that he understands social interactions in a way that <laughs> yeah, others don't. That's true, but I guess Jeremy's ultimately defeated by the power of empathy. <laughs> I yeah yeah hugs can't, yeah. Well, Detilio, I like too that he's he's been so mistreated by the world far more than Jeremy and he's the one telling him like but it was nice in some parts, master. Like Maurice is getting a lot of good jokes and uh, character through this impersonation that uh, Dottilio is. And, you know, the, the Ghostbusters mostly in this are animated without, you know, like shadowing or anything, like more in a blank, yeah, flat yeah. way. But when at the end here, when they pull out their proton guns, the, the shadows, the coloring on them is so much more dynamic. I did notice that, yeah. And I love the shot of them blasting the door off the hinges and then all lining up to zap him like that's so cool i really pity cindy in this scene i you could read it multiple ways as her realizing she was wrong and wanting to get back together with him i read it more as a poor girl stuck with a mad crazy ex-lover yeah who has to distract him sort of like talking him off the ledge or like yeah. pretending to meet his demands while the cops are ready, ready to cuff him or whatever yeah, exactly like oh no jeremy i i totally believe you um this can work out out uh, you don't have to kill everything everything i also like that he just des- jeremy describes it as like a good thing of like oh and we kill everybody though then it'll just be me and you and we work for our dark masters like fun. isn't that great yeah i love uh, again the satanic panic 80s cartoon uh, 80s era the cartoon says we will serve the darkness yes yeah they can only get so specific and yes uh, as as she distracts jeremy the ghostbusters come up with quite a plan You've got an idea, don't you, you kid or you? A way we can take this guy out. Come on, fill us in. (laughs) There's only one way. We'll have to set our proton packs on simultaneous overload. Oh, great, Egon. We do that, it'll take Jeremy out all right. And the building. There'll be a blast crater half a mile wide. And since we'll have to keep hold of them until they blow to make sure they aren't turned off. Oh, man. We take out everything within a quarter mile, ourselves with it hope it's enough to destroy him too before he can destroy the rest of the world it's a great plan count me in (laughs) that shows you that venkman while a coward and egotistical and all these things he's like you know what yeah noble sacrifice let's do it i'm in for but but he has to joke about it and they i they can't say die that you can't do that blown away or blown to bits or whatever they make it very clear to even a child like they're all dead they are going to die saving the world but they've got few other choices right and so uh, i also like that but like this is that venkman wanted a plan and then he's told the plan is like well we all die that's the plan (laughs) venkman's like well suicide mission all right i guess we're going along with it so with that in mind the ghostbusters are prepared to die Proton packs, maximum force. Remove safety. Initiate destruct sequence on my mark. Mark. Well, I guess this is it. Yeah, it's been nice working with you guys. <laughs> you too, Peter. Hey, ditto. Only next time, don't call me. I'll call you, okay? Janine. Boom. I forgot about that, yeah. His final thought is of Janine. That's oh, yeah. what he thinks is his final thought. Yikes. Yeah, that's uh, for Janine Egon Shippers. That's one of their favorite moments because it is, it does. That's an unneeded line. Like he could have said anything. And to give Egon the last line instead of a joke from Venkman, that shows this is a more heartfelt episode yeah. than other ones. He still has unfinished business on this earth, Egon. He realizes like uh, you can see Egon thinking, oh, all the time I wasted, I should have been with Janine. Uh, we, I loved her. And she loved me. What a fool I was. I think too, seeing Jeremy and Cindy talk also is showing him what a mistake he it's making him think of his own love life. It's like when you see a couple fight in public and you're like, I have something better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy, man. How good for me. <laughs> and so Cindy is failing to talk him down, but Dottilio then prevents him from playing the final notes on his death flute mm. and uh, almost falls to his death. And th- so this was the bit I was like, boy, Jeremy and Dottilio are 
are so close. Like he's his yeah. loyal companion. We get more backstory into Tilio through this uh, stirring speech. I don't know if JMS was intentionally doing it, but it does feel like there. Obviously, this is a fan ficky explanation too. But it does feel like the real connection is between Jeremy and Tilio, not Jeremy and Cindy. Mm. And that, you know, maybe that's why things couldn't work out with Cindy as well, because Jeremy's heart really belongs to his friend Dottilio, uh, who like in that. But Dottilio is so, you know, sad about his looks that he can't go. They can't go for it. Like, it's funny, too, that to think that Jeremy would rather commit the crime of destroying the world than loving a man. Mm. That would be that's too far. That's some 80s values. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is all just me yeah. making shit up. But listen to this speech between the two of them and tell me this is just a couple of buds. What have you done? You would have gone on. Me the fool. No, you're the fool. You've thrown away everything because the world hurt you. Well, look at me. Yes, I'm small and I'm twisted and I'm ugly, but at least I'm still human. 30 seconds to detonation. Nobody ever said the world was an easy place. Nobody ever said you wouldn't be hurt. you weren't sufficiently loved, it's your own fault, not the world's. Dottilio, please. You, you're my only friend. You can't do this. Just take my hand. No, I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> you're the one who doesn't care. You, you were born with everything. I had nothing. But I'll have more humanity, more love in my going out than you'll ever have. Ten seconds. All right, I'll stop it. I promise. Now, come on, Dottilio. There's not much time. Wow. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing it, and I'm mm. seeing it now. Like, <laughs> he wanted to create a new world with just those two people yeah, in it. Just me and you. And we then uh, the thought of losing him was enough to make him drop all of this. Not even, like, the woman wasn't the one to convince him, yeah, really. Cindy, you're right. You're totally right Cindy about that. Cindy showed up and tell him, like, please don't kill everybody. That includes me, too. And he's like, nah, got to do it. It's going to be me and Dottilio. Two bros. It bros is a bro- out. It is kind of a bros before hoes. Uh, I, say that, that, uh, yeah. I say that facetiously. But, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but, but, yes, when he's like, like, please, I can't go on without you. No, I, I'd i rather die than be than be what you've become. Like, okay, fine, I'll stop. I'll give up my plan, but only for you, Dottilio. Wow, yeah, yeah. Uh, see, I'm not just a queer making up <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Speaking of very anime moments, the, like, Full execution of him grabbing his hand like that is absolutely oh, just yeah. taken from anime. And same with like the movement of Cindy hugging Dottilio and the way her hair moves even. Oh All god, yeah. So anime. Yeah. So and by that I mean the practices of Japanese animation and Japanese animators that had been perfected to this point. I don't want to make anime sound like it's like this magical like flavor you add <laughs> to a stew or whatever. If you think we're obsessed with anime, we are and it's because of shows like this. Yes. yes, yeah. When we do bad shows that aren't anime, like we aren't nice. We <laughs> we we just talk about how crap Thundar is, or how that Spider Man episode looked like shit. Uh, but Oof. yes, the Ghostbusters finally can exhale. They're like, oh, thank God we don't have to. The, it's nice you have a little counter from Egon to let you know how little time is left. And so they decide they are not going to all blow up because he's going to play the Song of Life, which, again, that's a cop out. But it's a kid's show. You can't actually yeah. kill millions of people as his actions had done. It's the reset button this syndicated series needs. Yeah. So uh, in a less kiddie show, Jeremy would have sacrificed himself to play this song and especially it's crazy that the evil presence didn't kill him for breaking their deal here by stopping to play the song uh but yes then dark presence or i don't i don't think they really give it a name it appears to let the to let jeremy know he can't back out of this ragnarok thing so easily detilio i'll stop it detilio i promise Oh, all right. Switch off, everybody. (laughs) You don't have to tell me twice. As there's a song of destruction, there's a song of life. I'll play it all back the way it was. No, my time has come. You cannot stop me now. Just one chance. We have to hope he weakened it enough for the proton beams to affect it. Fire! 
The sound effects. <laughs> yeah. The, we talked about it on Megas XLR, that kind of just yeah. like swing yeah. sound. Like, yeah. Uh, let you know, like, that's, that's a Team Rocket blasting off again kind yeah. of sound. I mean, all their four lasers together, that absolutely reminds me of Sailor Moon, a Toei production as well. Like, just when their four lasers combine, they <laughs> blast people away. They, they're way over crossing the streams at this point. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we got rid of that rule. <laughs> but, yeah, it's such an anime execution of them all blasting at once, though it also feels like a script note that was, well, if Jeremy just undoes everything, then what are the Ghostbusters doing in their own show? Yeah, give them something to do. They at least get to save the J- day in the in the Jeremy show. They shoot the giant face. <laughs> and man, talk about scary things. It's transformation of the face. Oh, after the yeah. Ugh, that I- is frightening that would have given me nightmares as a five-year-old for sure so that's why i don't think i saw this one when it first aired because if i had it would have scared the crap out of me <laughs> yeah the the ray peter exchange of don't let go i kind of figured that ray that's a very Ackroyd murray exchange too they they definitely got the feel of those characters they shuffle off the dark entity but then they see that the flute that can play the song of life is broken so through the power of friendship Aww. they they re they heal the form flute. the flute the the flute is saved. Jeremy plays it one more time with the song of life that fixes it all. And uh, we get our happy ending with some nice, happy ending 80s music. I love it. Did, did I do it? I think you did just fine. We all did, my friend. You pan up to the sky like an anime. <laughs> I and that music, God, I yeah. love that music. Uh, that's that's the sound of the '80s to me. It really is. Yeah, all but, those songs, all the incidental music is in my head. But I feel like Winston should have shoved him off of a building and just like you killed everybody, yeah. you motherfucker. I feel like they they could have gotten rid of him even in a kids show because I feel like the one time you can kill a character or just have them like get vaporized or like they, he was sent away or whatever yeah. is if they are ba- like if is if evil is punished i think it's yeah. the one time you can actually have a death in a kid show that makes me think even more that this is jms talking about his own anger because he's mm. like well i don't want to kill my avatar yeah my surrogate episode. yeah uh, but it does feel slightly wrong to me that winston is like i think you did it man like no no, he's evil. Yeah. In, in my fan fiction, he dies right after this scene. He's like, oh, that took too much energy for me, uh, and I'm dead. You he's know? killed after he rescues Totilio, mm-hmm. and uh, they all they all heal the flute together, and it plays some song automatically, and the yeah, thing is, the thing yeah. is saved. Uh, but the, the one more thing in the episode that made me think of the gay angle to it is that when Jeremy goes back to his human look, there is a shot of him and Totilio like embracing and looking at each other oh you're right and sydney's in the middle looking at the two and i mean that is very much an anime friendship shot for yeah. sure but also it does imply of like sydney is happy that her two gay friends Aww. are reunited like finally you guys are together we can all just be friends now though then right after that shot as they're looking at the you know sunny sky together she's standing next to jeremy like they're arm in arm and i really don't like that i don't want to believe that she got back to together with him because yeah. definitely his plan to end the world as punishment for her should not get him his girlfriend back that that's needs, wrong at least go to couples therapy first <laughs> i mean they still won't change her career he's what she gonna say like oh, i'm throwing away my career jeremy like i i am gonna get married to you now after i saw how much you loved me by killing millions of people totally want to get back <laughs> together with you then we get to the credits which love them uh, credits, yeah man. they're like doing the dance from the music video right yeah it's straight like, from walking the down music the street video. yeah uh, and i i mean i 
I love that music video dance, except now Slimer's flying through it and Vakeman's kicking him away and yeah. falling down. And it's just a great, like, forever scroll. If you got the textless credits and you can just have their snap and finger guns over and over. I think for, I've seen forever. that gif. I love that. I lo- I, I'm, if it doesn't exist, then I shall bring it into existence. Mm. Someone must have made it for sure. But they, yeah, and it's again the Ghostbusters song one more time over the credits. But normally that's just being talked over about the next cartoon you're going to see. Yeah. So you're not hearing that anyway. And yeah, actual Japanese names on it too. Like, that was nice to see instead of like overseas animation or like, sorry, animation services by yes, vaguely yeah. named company that you don't know where they're from. Warner was worse at it than Deke. I think maybe it's because KK Deke was uh, getting, the, mm-hmm. getting people. I, I giggle like saying it. Don't it, like yeah. it. Uh, well, uh, hey, the geek. Ku Klux Deek. <laughs> geek is gone now. A Deek is gone now. No more. Uh, I mean, I think it's shambles or somewhere else. But uh, yeah, there's there's no more Deek. But that was a really really great episode of Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. I think one yeah. of their best written runs there is. You you get a little Slimer, but that's all yeah. you need. They're like, not all this good, but I watched no. a ton of them uh, when the DVDs came out about a decade ago, and they are all like above average, and some mm-hmm. of them are even great. And uh, but you have to stick to those like sixty five syndicated ones really but that's like a lot of content though when you make 65 episodes in a year not all of them are great you yeah. know uh, but we had that with all of it. like DuckTales had some not good episodes Darkwing Duck had some Kennedy oh, Tunes sure. shit in Oof. there like, yeah yeah the, I had to kick Kennedy Tunes once on this <laughs> thing but uh, it's a law but yeah, I, uh, this made me remember Ghostbusters is better than I thought as a kid. And it also reminded me, though, that like Slimer and the real Ghostbusters suck and I don't like it. But uh, I could totally see, I definitely want to do in the future a Slimer and the real Ghostbusters episode and an Extreme Ghostbusters episode. Oh, that'd be episode. great. Yeah. yeah, in the future. Once again, my nostalgia is correct. The show is verified. <laughs> yeah. it. This was uh, the only right time to be a child is yes. what we were and we remember it correctly. I pity all of you who are between five years older or five years younger than <laughs> me but really I, too but, bad. but I do think for kids, it's uh, it's not too dated. I mean, it is a very 80s show, but I think it used to play on Netflix. I don't think it's available not on anymore. streaming thing anymore. Yeah. But I, I look forward. I think uh, kids today would still probably like it. Just the, the idea of being a Ghostbuster. Harold Ramis in the, one of those extras I watched actually was had an interesting thing of like, he liked that kids like to play as Ghostbusters oh. because it was about teamwork and working together. It wasn't about, you know, cops and robbers or whatever that's true uh that was one of the games i played with my friend uh my friend philip and i played ghostbusters a lot as kids and i was he was egon because he liked egon the the best and i was uh, peter vankman of course yes of course i uh though i feel like i'm more the ray to your vankman now (laughs) but uh the what kid played is Ray. That's like, true. But yeah, lots, lots of fun. So that's been our episode of What a Cartoon about the real Ghostbusters. Thank you for listening, folks. If you want to support the show and get every podcast of this and Talking Simpsons one week ahead of time and ad free, please go to patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons and you'll get just that along with all of our $5 paywall podcasts if you sign up for $5. That includes everything we've done behind that paywall for the past two plus years, including all of our limited miniseries. The most recent one was Talk King of the hill and there will be a new mini series this fall for patrons only so you want to get on that if you like our voices there's so many episodes you haven't heard if you enjoy us discussing cartoons and there's also a newish it's now becoming old ten dollar tier that has tons and tons of three plus hour monthly podcasts henry what's going on there yeah for our premium subscribers you can hear the what a cartoon movie podcast it's like this but twice as long about an animated feature film once a month. Our most recent one we did back in July was Beavis and Butthead Do America and then in August we did Rocco's Modern Life Static Cling, the original movie. We, uh, at the time of this recording, I haven't seen it yet, but boy, I bet we did a great job. And uh, so you should check that out and all of the previous ones we did over 24 hours of premium podcast content. You can only hear if you're a $10 and up patron. So please, once more consider going to the $10 level at patreon.com slash talking simpsons we are ready to believe (laughs) you so I've been one of your hosts for this, Bob Mackey. I'm on Twitter as Bob Servo. My other podcast is Retronauts, the classic gaming podcast every Monday and occasionally on Friday. Go to Retronauts.com and look for Retronauts in your podcast device. If you enjoy classic video games, you'll enjoy the podcast. And I believe in 2015 or 2016, I did a podcast all about every Ghostbusters game. Mm. So you can look that up. It'll be a good compliment to this episode of What a Cartoon. Yeah, well, there was a Data East arcade game of real Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. Wasn't there. But you, yeah. you just played nondescript Ghostbusters. 
monsters. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at H E N E R E Y G. I am sure to tweet out whenever new What a Cartoon and Talking Simpsons podcasts go live, both on the free feed and on the Patreon, with tons of other information. So be sure to follow me there on Twitter, H E N E R E Y G. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next week for the Angry Beavers episodes Up All Night and Dag for Night. And we will see you then. Actually, you're right. The end of the world is upon us. It is? You mean this is the real thing? Well, shoot. Looks like I'll have to find myself another line of work. <laughs>